Chapter Thirteen of The Making of an American by Jacob A. Rees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen Roosevelt Comes, Mulberry Street's Golden Age. See how things fall out. Hardly had I sent the chapter to the printer, in which I posted proofreaders as enemies of mankind, when here comes the proof of the previous one, with a cordial note of thanks from this particular enemy for the inspiration he found in it. So then I was mistaken, as I have been often before, and owe him the confession. Good land! What are we that we should think ourselves always right, or, lest we do wrong, sit idly all our lives waiting for light? The light comes as we work toward it. Roosevelt was right when he said that the only one who never makes mistakes is the one who never does anything. Preserve us from him, from the man who eternally wants to hold the scales even, and so never gets done weighing, never hands anything over the counter. Take him away and put red blood into his veins, and let the rest of us go ahead and make our mistakes, as few as we can, as many as we must. Only let us go ahead." all of which has reference to other things I have in mind, not to the proofreader, against whom I have no grudge to-day. As for him, perhaps, he is just a sign that the world moves. Move it did, at last, in the year, 1894, that gave us the Lexow Investigating Committee, the Citizens' Seventy, and Reform. Tammany went out, speeded on its way by Dr. Parkhurst, and an administration came in that was pledged to all we had been longing and labouring for. For three years we had free hands and we used them. Mayor Strong's administration was not the millennium, but it brought New York much nearer to it than it had ever been, and it set up some standards toward which we may keep on striving with profit to ourselves. The mayor himself was not a saint. He was an honest gentleman of sturdy purpose to do the right, and, normally, of singular practical wisdom in choosing the men to help him do it, but with an intermittent delusion that he was a shrewd politician. When it came uppermost, he made bargains and appointed men to office who did their worst to undo what good the Warings, the Roosevelts, and their kind had wrought. In the struggle that ensued, Mayor Strong was always on the side of right, but when he wanted most to help, he could not. It is the way of the world. Nevertheless, as I said, it moved. How far we came is history, plain to read in our streets that will never again be as dirty as they were, though they may not be as clean as Waring left them. In the three score, splendid new schoolhouses that stand as monuments of those busy years. In the open spots that let the sunlight into the slum where it was darkest and most foul in the death-rate that came down from 26.32 per thousand of the living in 1887 to 19.53 in 1897. That was the ten years' war I wrote about and have here before referred to. The three years of the strong administration saw all the big battles in which we beat the slum. I am not going to rehearse them, for I am trying to tell my own story, and now I am soon done with it. I carried a gun as a volunteer in that war, and that was all, not even in the ranks at that. I was ever an irregular, given to sniping on my own hook. Roosevelt, indeed, wanted me to have a seat among Mayor Strong's official advisers, but we had it out over that when he told me of it, and the compact we made that he should never ask that service of me he has kept. So he spared the Mayor much embarrassment. For, as I said, I am not good in the ranks, more is the pity, and me he saved for such use as I could be of, which was well, for shortly it all centred in Mulberry Street, where he was. We were not strangers, it could not have been long after I wrote How the Other Half Lives, that he came to the evening sun office one day looking for me. I was out and he left his card, merely writing on the back of it that he had read my book and had come to help. That was all, and it tells the whole story of the man. I loved him from the day I first saw him. Not ever in all the years that have passed has he failed of the promise made then. No one ever helped as he did. For two years we were brothers in Mulberry Street. When he left I had seen its golden age. I knew too well the evil day that was coming back to have any heart in it after that. 
not that we were carried heavenward on flowery beds of ease while it lasted there is very little ease where theodore roosevelt leads as we all of us found out the lawbreaker found it out who predicted scornfully that he would knuckle down to politics the way they all did and lived to respect him though he swore at him as the one of them all who was stronger than pull the peace-loving citizen who hastened to police headquarters with anxious entreaties to use discretion in the enforcement of unpopular laws found it out and went away with a new and breathless notion welling up in him of an official's sworn duty that was it that was what made the age golden that for the first time a moral purpose came into the street in the light of it everything was transformed not all at once it took us weary months to understand that the shouting about the enforcement of the dead excise law was lying treachery or rank ignorance one as bad as the other the excise law was not dead it was never so much alive as under tammany but it was enforced only against those saloon keepers who needed discipline it was a tammany club used to drive them into camp with and it was used so vigorously that no less than eight thousand arrests were made under it in the year before roosevelt made them all close up pretty lively corpse that but we understood at last most of us understood that the tap-root of the police blackmail was there and that it had to be pulled up if we were ever to get farther we understood that we were the victims of our own shamming and we grew to be better citizens for it the police force became an army of heroes for a season all the good in it came out and there is a lot of it in the worst of times roosevelt had the true philosopher's stone that turns dross to gold in his own sturdy faith in his fellow man men became good because he thought them so by which i am not to be understood as meaning that he just voted them good the police for instance and sat by waiting to see the wings grow no but he helped them sprout it is long since I have enjoyed anything so much as I did those patrol trips of ours on the last tour between midnight and sunrise, which earned for him the name of Harun al Roosevelt. I had at last found one who was willing to get up when other people slept, including, too often, the police, and see what the town looked like then. He was more than willing. I laid out the route, covering ten or a dozen patrol posts and we met at two a.m. on the steps of the Union League Club, objects of suspicion on the part of two or three attendants and a watchman who shadowed us as night prowlers till we were out of their bailiwick. I shall never forget that first morning when we travelled for three hours along First and Second and Third Avenues from 42nd Street to Bellevue, and found of ten patrolmen just one doing his work faithfully two or three were chatting on saloon corners and guying the president of the board when he asked them if that was what they were there for one was sitting asleep on a butter tub in the middle of the sidewalk snoring so that you could hear him across the street and was inclined to be sassy when aroused and told to go about his duty mr roosevelt was a most energetic roundsman and a fair one to boot it was that quality which speedily won him the affection of the force he hunted high and low before he gave up his man, giving him every chance. We had been over one man's beat three times, searching every nook and cranny of it, and were reluctantly compelled to own that he was not there, when the boss of an all-night restaurant on Third Avenue came out with a club as we passed and gave the regulation signal raps on the sidewalk. There was some trouble in his place three times he repeated the signal calling for the patrolman on the beat before he turned to roosevelt who stood by with the angry exclamation where in thunder does that copper sleep he ordered told me when he give up the barber shop so's a fellow could find him we didn't find him then but he found the president of the board later on when summoned to police headquarters to explain why he had changed his sleeping quarters the whole force woke up as a result of that night's work and it kept awake those two years for as it learned by experience mr roosevelt's spectacles might come gleaming around the corner at any hour he had not been gone a year before the chief found it necessary to transfer half the force in an uptown precinct to keep it awake the firemen complained that fires at night gained too much headway while the police slept there was no roosevelt to wake them up 
Looking after his patrolmen was not the only errand that took him abroad at night. As police president, Mr. Roosevelt was a member of the health board, and sometimes it was the tenements we went inspecting when the tenants slept. He was after facts, and learned speedily to get them as he could. When, as governor, he wanted to know just how the factory law was being executed, he came down from Albany and spent a whole day with me personally investigating tenements in which sweating was carried on. I had not found a governor before, or a police president either, who would do it, but so he learned exactly what he wanted to know, and what he ought to do, and did it. I never saw Theodore Roosevelt to better advantage than when he confronted the labor men at their meeting-place, Clarendon Hall. The police were all the time having trouble with strikers and their pickets. Roosevelt saw that it was because neither party understood fully the position of the other, and, with his usual directness, sent word to the labor organizations that he would like to talk it over with them. At his request I went with him to the meeting. It developed almost immediately that the labor men had taken a wrong measure of the man. They met him as a politician playing for points, and hinted at trouble unless their demands were met. Mr. Roosevelt broke them off short. "'Gentlemen,' he said, with that snap of the jaws that always made people listen, "'I asked to meet you, hoping that we might come to understand one another. Remember, please, before we go farther, that the worst injury any one of you can do to the cause of labour is to counsel violence. It will also be worse for himself. Understand distinctly that order will be kept. The police will keep it. Now we can proceed.' I was never so proud and pleased as when they applauded him to the echo. He reddened with pleasure, for he saw that the best in them had come out on top, as he expected it would. It was of this incident that a handle was first made by Mr. Roosevelt's enemies in and out of the police board, and he had many, to attack him. It happened that there was a music hall in the building in which the labor men met. The yellow newspapers circulated the lie that he went there on purpose to see the show, and the ridiculous story was repeated until the liars nearly persuaded themselves that it was so. They would not have been able to understand the kind of man they had to do with, had they tried. Accordingly they fell into their own trap. It is a tradition of Mulberry Street that the notorious Seeley dinner raid was planned by his enemies in the department of which he was the head in the belief that they would catch Mr. Roosevelt there. The diners were supposed to be his set. Some time after that I was in his office one day, when a police official of superior rank came in and requested private audience with him. They stepped aside and the policeman spoke in an undertone, urging something strongly. Mr. Roosevelt listened. Suddenly I saw him straighten up as a man recoils from something unclean, and dismiss the other with a sharp, no, sir, I don't fight that way. The policeman went out crestfallen. Roosevelt took two or three turns about the floor, struggling evidently with strong disgust. He told me afterward that the man had come to him with what he said was certain knowledge that his enemy could that night be found in a known evil house uptown, which it was his alleged habit to visit. His proposition was to raid it then, and so get square. To the policeman it must have seemed like throwing a good chance away. But it was not Roosevelt's way. He struck no blow below the belt. In the governor's chair afterward he gave the politicians whom he fought, and who fought him, the same terms. They tried their best to upset him, for they had nothing to expect from him. But they knew and owned that he fought fair. Their backs were secure. He never tricked them to gain an advantage. A promise given by him was always kept to the letter. Failing to trap him only added to the malignity of his enemies. Roosevelt was warned that he was shadowed night and day, but he laughed their scheming to scorn. It is an article of faith with him that an honest man has nothing to fear from plotters, and he walked unharmed among their snares. The whole country remembers the year-long fight in the police board, and Mayor Strong's vain attempt to remove the obstructionist who, under an ill-conceived law, was able to hold up the scheme of reform. Most of the time I was compelled to stand idly by, unable to help. Once I eased my feelings by telling Commissioner Parker in his own office what I thought of him. 
I went in and shut the door, and then told it all to him. Nor did I mince matters. I might not get so good a chance again. Mr. Parker sat quite still, poking the fire. When I ceased at last, angry and exasperated, he looked up and said calmly, "'Well, Mr. Rees, what you tell me has at least the merit of frankness.' "'You see how it was. I should never have been able to help in the board. Out of it my chance came at last, when it was deemed necessary to give the adversary a character. Mr. Roosevelt had been speaking to the Methodist ministers, and as usual had carried all before him. The community was getting up a temper that would shortly put an end to the deadlock in the police board, and set the wheels of reform moving again. Then one day we heard that Commissioner Parker had been invited by the Christian endeavourers of an uptown church to address them on Christian citizenship. That was not consecrated common sense. I went to the convention of endeavourers the next week, and told them so. I asked them to send a dispatch to Governor Black then and there, endorsing Roosevelt and Mayor Strong, and urging him to end the deadlock that made public scandal by removing Commissioner Parker. And they did. I regret to say that I felt compelled to take a like course with the Methodist ministers, for so I grieved a most good-natured gentleman, Colonel Grant, who was Mr. Parker's ally in the board. Grant was what was described as a great Methodist but I feel sure that Brother Simmons would have approved of me. I was following the course he laid down. The one loyal friend Mr. Roosevelt had in the board was Avery D. Andrews, a strong, sensible, and clean young man, who stood by his chief to the last, and left with him a good mark on the force. The yellow newspapers fomented most industriously the trouble in the board, never failing to take the wrong side of any question. One of them set about doling out free soup that winter, when work was slack, as a means, of course, of advertising its own charity. Of all forms of indiscriminate almsgiving, that is the most offensive and most worthless, and they knew it, or they would not have sent me a wheedling invitation to come and inspect their relief work, offering to have a carriage take me around. I sent word back that I should certainly look into the soup, but that I should go on foot to it. Roosevelt and I made the inspection together. We questioned the tramps in line, and learned from their own lips that they had come from out of town to take it easy in a city where a man did not have to work to live. We followed the pails that were carried away from the relief station by children, their contents sometimes to figure afterwards as free lunch in the saloon where they had been exchanged for beer, and, knowing the facts, we denounced the thing as a nuisance. The paper printed testimonials from Commissioners Parker and Grant, who certified from Mulberry Street, which they had not left, that the soup was a noble Christian charity, and so thought it even things up, I suppose. I noticed, however, that the soup ran out soon after, and I hope we have seen the last of it. We can afford to leave that to Philadelphia, where common sense appears to be drowned in it. I had it out with them at last altogether. When I have told of it, let the whole wretched thing depart and be gone for good. It was after Roosevelt had gone away. That he was not there was no bar to almost daily attacks on him, under which I chafed, sitting at the meetings as a reporter. I knew right well they were intended to provoke me to an explosion that might have given grounds for annoying me, and I kept my temper until, one day, when, the subject of dives being mentioned, Commissioner Parker drawled, with the reporter from the soup journal whispering in his ear, "'Was not uh, that the place where uh, Mr. Roosevelt went to see a show with his friend?' He was careful not to look in my direction, but the reporter did, and I leaped at the challenge. I waited until the board had formally adjourned, then halted it as Mr. Parker was trying to escape. I do not now remember what I said. It would not make calm reading, I suspect. It was the truth, anyhow, and came pretty near being the whole truth. Mr. Parker fled, putting his head back through the half-closed door to explain that he only knew what that reporter told him. In the security of his room it must have occurred to him, however, that he had another string to his bow, for at the next session Commissioner Grant moved my expulsion because I had disturbed the board meeting but President Moss reminded him curtly that I had done nothing of the kind, 
and that ended it. One of the early and sensational results of reform in Mulberry Street was the retirement of Superintendent Burns. There was not one of us all who had known him long who did not regret it, though I, for one, had to own the necessity of it. For Burns stood for the old days that were bad. But, chained as he was in the meanness and smallness of it all, he was yet cast in a different mould. Compared with his successor, he was a giant every way. Burns was a big policeman. We shall not soon have another like him, and that may be both good and bad. He was unscrupulous, he was for Burns, he was a policeman, in short, with all the failings of the trade. But he made the detective service great. He chased the thieves to Europe, or gave them license to live in New York, on condition that they did not rob there. He was a czar, with all the autocrats' irresponsible powers, and he exercised them as he saw fit. If they were not his, he took them anyhow. Police service looks to results first. There was that in Burns which made me stand up for him in spite of it all. Twice I held Mr. Parkhurst from his throat, but in the end I had to admit that the doctor was right. I believed that, untrammeled, Burns might have been a mighty engine for good, and it was with sorrow I saw him go. He left no one behind him fit to wear his shoes. Burns was a born policeman. Those who hated him said he was also a born tyrant. He did ride a high horse when the fit was on him, and he thought it served his purpose. So we came into collision in the early days when he was captain in Mercer Street. They had a prisoner over there with a story which I had caused to believe my rivals had obtained. I went to Burns, and was thundered out of the station-house. There he was boss, and it suited him to let me see it. We had not met before. We met again that night. I went to the superintendent of police, who was a Republican, and applying all the pressure of the tribune, which I served, got from him an order on Captain Burns to let me interview his prisoner. Old Mr. Walling tore his hair, said the thing had never been done before, and it had not. But I got the order and got the interview, though Burns, black with rage, commanded a policeman to stand on either side of the prisoner while I talked to him. He himself stood by, glaring at me. It was not a good way to get an interview, and, in fact, the man had nothing to tell. But I had my way, and I made the most of it. After that, Captain Burns and I got along. We got to think a lot of each other after a while. Perhaps he was a tyrant because he was set over crooks, and crooks are cowards in the presence of authority. His famous third degree was chiefly what he no doubt considered a little wholesome slugging. He would beat a thief into telling him what he wanted to know. Thieves have no rights a policeman thinks himself bound to respect. But when he had to do with men with minds, he had other resources. He tortured his prisoner into confession in the Unger murder case by locking him up out of reach of a human voice, or sight of a human face, in the basement of police headquarters, and keeping him there four days, fed by invisible hands. On the fifth he had him brought up through a tortuous way, where the tools he had used in murdering his partner were displayed on the walls as if by accident. Led into the inspector's presence by the jailer, he was made to stand while Burns finished a letter. Then he turned his piercing glance upon him with a gesture to sit. The murderer sank trembling upon a lounge, the only piece of furniture in the room, and sprang to his feet with a shriek the next instant. It was the one upon which he had slaughtered his friend, all blood bespattered as then. He sprawled upon the floor, a gibbering, horror-stricken wretch, and confessed his sin. As in this instance, so in the McGloin murder case, the moral certainty of guilt was absolute, but the legal evidence was lacking. McGloin was a young ruffian who had murdered a saloon-keeper at a midnight raid on his place. He was the fellow who, the night before he was hanged, invited the chief of detectives to come over to the wake, they'll have a devil of a time. For six months Burns had tried everything to bring the crime home to him, but in vain. At last he sent out and had McGloin and his two pals arrested, but so that none of them knew of the plight of the others. McGloin was taken to Mulberry Street, and orders were given to bring the others in at a certain hour fifteen or twenty minutes apart. Burns put McGloin at the window in his office while he questioned him. Nothing could be got out of him. 
As he sat there, a door was banged below. Looking out, he saw one of his friends led across the yard in charge of policemen. Burns, watching him narrowly, saw his cheek blanch. But still his nerve held. Fifteen minutes passed. Another door banged. The murderer, looking out, saw his other pal led in a prisoner. He looked at Burns. The chief nodded. Squealed. Both. It was a lie, and it cost the man his life. The jig is up, then, he said, and told the story that brought him to the gallows. I could not let Burns go without a word, for he filled a large space in my life. It is the reporter, I suppose, who sticks out there. The boys called him a great faker, but they were hardly just to him in that. I should rather call him a great actor, and without being that no man can be a great detective. He made life in a mean street picturesque while he was there, and for that something is due him. He was the very opposite of Roosevelt, quite without moral purpose or the comprehension of it, yet with a streak of kindness in him that sometimes put preaching to shame. Mulberry Street swears by him to-day, even as it does under its breath, by Roosevelt. Decide from that for yourself, whether his presence there was for the good or the bad. In writing How the Other Half Lives, I had been at great pains not to overstate my case. I knew that it would be questioned, and was anxious that no flaws should be picked in it, for, if there were, harm might easily come of it instead of good. I saw now that in that I had been wise. The Gilder Tenement House Commission more than confirmed all that I had said about the tenements and the schools. The Reinhardt Committee was even more emphatic on the topic of child labour. I was asked to serve on the Seventies Subcommittee on Small Parks. In the spring of 1896 the Council of Confederated Good Government Clubs appointed me its general agent, and I held the position for a year, giving all my spare time to the planning and carrying out of such work as it seemed to me ought to make a record for a reform administration. We wanted it to last. That was a great year. They wanted a positive programme, and my notions of good government were nothing if not positive. They began and ended with the people's life. We tore down unfit tenements, forced the opening of parks and playgrounds, the establishment of a truant school and the remodelling of a whole school system, the demolition of the overcrowded old tombs, and the erection on its site of a decent new prison. We overhauled the civil courts and made them over new in the charter of the Greater New York. We lighted dark halls, closed the cruller bakeries in tenement house cellars that had caused the loss of no end of lives, for the crullers were boiled in fat in the early morning hours while the tenants slept, and when the fat was spilled in the fire their peril was awful. We fought the cable car managers at home and the opponents of a truant school at Albany. We backed up Roosevelt in his fight in the police board and, well, I shall never get time to tell it all but it was a great year. That it did not keep the good government clubs alive was no fault of my programme. It was mine, I guess. I failed to inspire them with the faith that was in me. I had been going it alone so long that I did not know how to use the new tool that had come to hand. There is nothing like an organisation if you know how to use it. I did not. Perhaps, also, politics had something to do with it. They were in for playing the game. I never understood it. But if I did not make the most of it, I had a good time that year. There were first the two small parks to be laid out over on the east side, where the Gilder Commission had pointed to the smothering crowds. I had myself made a member of the Citizens Committee that was appointed to locate them. It did not take us any nine years or six or three. We did the business in three weeks, and having chosen the right spots, we went to the legislature with a bill authorizing the city to seize the property at once, ahead of condemnation, and it was passed. We were afraid that Tammany might come back, and the event proved that we were wise. You bring up the people slowly to a reform program, particularly when it costs money. They will pay for corruption with a growl, but seem to think that virtue ought always to be had for nothing. It makes the politicians' game easy. They steal the money for improvements, and predict that reform will raise the tax rate. When the prophecy comes true, they take the people back in their sheltering embrace with an I told you so, and the people nestle there repentant. 
There was a housing conference at which that part of the work was parcelled out. The building of model tenements to the capitalists who formed the City and Suburban Homes Company. The erection of model lodging houses to D. O. Mills, the banker philanthropist, who was anxious to help that way. I chose for the good government clubs the demolition of the old tenements. It was my chance. I hated them. A law had been made the year before empowering the health board to seize and destroy tenement house property that was a threat to the city's health, but it had remained a dead letter. The authorities hesitated to attack property rights, vested rights. Charles G. Wilson, the president of the board, was a splendid executive, but he was a holdover Tammany appointee and needed backing. Now that Theodore Roosevelt sat in the health board, fresh from his war on the police lodging rooms of which I told, they hesitated no longer. I put before the board a list of the sixteen worst rear tenements in the city outside of the bend, and while the landlords held their breath in astonishment, they were seized, condemned, and their tenants driven out. The Mott Street barracks were among them. In 1888 the infant death rate among the 350 Italians they harboured had been 325 per thousand, that is to say, one-third of all the babies died that year. That was the kind of evidence upon which those rear tenements were arraigned. Ninety-four of them, all told, were seized that year, and in them there had been in four years 956 deaths, a rate of 62.9 when the general city death rate was 24.63. I shall have, once more, and for the last time, to refer to A Ten Years' War, for the full story of that campaign. As I said, it was great. Conceive, if you can, the state of mind of a man to whom a dark, overcrowded tenement had ever been as a personal affront, now suddenly finding himself commissioned with letters of mark and reprisal, as it were, to seize and destroy the enemy wherever found, not one at a time, but by blocks and battalions in the laying out of parks. I fed fat my ancient grudge and grew good humour enough to last me for a dozen years in those two. They were the years when, in spite of hard work, I began to grow stout, and honestly, I think it was tearing down the tenements that did it. Directly or indirectly, I had a hand in destroying seven whole blocks of them as I counted up. I wish it had been seventy. The landlords sued, but the courts sided with the health board. When at last we stopped to take breath, we had fairly broken the back of the slum and made precedents of our own that would last a while. Mr. Roosevelt was personally sued twice, I think, but that was all the good it did them. We were having our innings that time and there were a lot of arrears to collect. The city paid for the property that was taken, of course, and more than it ought to have paid, to my way of thinking. The law gave the owner of a tenement that was altogether unfit just the value of the brick and timbers that were in it. It was enough, for unfit meant murderous, and why should a man have a better right to kill his neighbour with a house than with an axe in the street? But the lawyers who counselled compromise bought Gotham Court, one of the most hopeless slums in the Fourth Ward, for nearly twenty thousand dollars. It was not worth so many cents. The barracks with their awful baby death rate were found to be mortgaged to a cemetery corporation. The Board of Health gave them the price of opening one grave for their share, and tore down the rear tenements. A year or two later I travelled to Europe on an ocean steamer with the treasurer of that graveyard concern. We were ten days on the way, and I am afraid he did not have altogether a good time of it. The ghost of the barracks would keep rising out of the deep before us, sitting there in our steamer chairs, from whichever quarter the wind blew. I suppose he took it as a victory when the Court of Appeals decided upon a technicality that the barracks should not have been destroyed. But so did I, for they were down by that time. The city could afford to pay. We were paying for our own neglect, and it was a good lesson. I have said more than once in these pages that I am not good at figuring, and I am not. A child could do better. For that very reason I am going to claim full credit for every time I do a sum right. It may not happen again. Twice during that spell, curiously enough, did I downright distinguish myself in that line. I shall never be able to tell you how. I only know that I did it. 
once was when i went before the board of estimate and apportionment to oppose an increase in the appropriation for the tombs which the commissioner of correction had asked for his plea was that there had been a large increase in the census of the prison and he marched up a column of figures to prove it to the amazement of the board and really if the truth be told of myself i demonstrated clearly from his own figures that not only had there been no increase but that there could not be without criminally overcrowding the wretched old prison in which already every cell had two inmates and some three the exhibit was so striking that the commissioner and his bookkeeper retired in confusion it was just the power of the facts again i wanted to have the horrid old pile torn down and had been sitting up nights acquainting myself with all that concerned it now it is gone and a good riddance to it the other computation was vastly more involved it concerned the schools about which no one knew anything for certain the annual reports of the department of education were models of how to say a thing so that no one by any chance could understand what it was about it was possible to prove from them that while there was notoriously a dearth of school accommodation while children knocked vainly for admission and the superintendent clamoured for more schools yet there were ten or twenty thousand seats to spare but it was not possible to get the least notion from them of what the real need was i tried for many months and then set about finding out for myself how many children who ought to be in school were drifting about the streets the truant officers professionally discreet thought about eight hundred the superintendent of schools guessed at eight thousand the officers of the association for the improvement of the condition of the poor with an eye on the tenements made it one hundred fifty thousand i canvassed a couple of wards from the truant officers reports and dr tracy compared the showing with the statistics of population from the result i reasoned that there must be about fifty thousand they scorned me at the city hall for it it was all guesswork they said and so it was we had first to have a school census and we got one so that we might know where we were at but when we had the result of that first census before us behold it showed that of three hundred thirty nine thousand seven hundred fifty six children of school age in the city two hundred fifty one thousand two hundred thirty five were accounted for on the roster of public or private schools twenty eight thousand four hundred fifty two were employed and fifty thousand sixty nine on the street or at home so that if i am not smart at figuring i may reasonably claim to be a good guesser the showing that a lack of schools which threw an army of children upon the street went hand in hand with overcrowding jails made us get up and demand that something be done from the school executive came the helpless suggestion that the thing might be mended by increasing the classes in neighbourhoods where there were not enough schools from sixty to seventy-five forty or forty-five pupils is held to be the safe limit anywhere but the time had passed for such pottering new york pulled itself together and spent millions in building new schools while the system was overhauled we dragged in a truant school by threatening the city authorities with the power of the state unless they ceased to send truants to institutions that received child criminals but a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still we shall have to do that all over again next my pet scheme was to have trained oculists attached to the public schools partly as a means of overcoming stupidity half of what passes for that in the children is really the teachers the little ones are near-sighted they cannot see the blackboard partly also that they might have an eye on the school buildings and help us get rid of some where they had to burn gas all day that was upset by the doctors who were afraid that private practice would be interfered with we had not quite got to the millennium yet it was so with our bill to establish a farm school to win back young vagrants to a useful life it was killed at albany with the challenge that we had had enough of reform in new york and so we had as the events showed tammany came back but not to stay we had secured a hold during those three years which i think they know little of they talk at the wigwam of the school vote and mean the men friends and kin of the teachers on whom the machine has a grip or thinks it has 
but there is another school vote that is yet to be heard from when the generation that has had its right to play restored to it comes to the polls that was the great gain of that time it was the thing i had in mind back of and beyond all the rest i was bound to kill the bend because it was bad i wanted the sunlight in there but so that it might shine on the children at play that is a child's right and it is not to be cheated of and when it is cheated of it is not the child but the community that is robbed of that beside which all its wealth is but tinsel and trash for men not money make a country great and joyless children do not make good men so when the legislature urged by the tenement house commission made it law that no public school should ever again be built in new york without an outdoor playground it touched the quick thereafter it was easy to rescue the small parks from the landscape gardener by laying them under the same rule it was well we did it too for he is a dangerous customer hard to get around twice he has tried to steal one of the little parks we laid out the one that is called seward park from the children and he points with pride almost to the playground in the other which he laid out so badly that it was a failure from the start however we shall convert him yet everything in its season the board of education puzzled over its end of it for a while the law did not say how big the playground should be and there was no precedent no there was not i found the key to that puzzle at least one that fitted when i was secretary of the small parks committee it was my last act as agent of the good government clubs to persuade major strong to appoint that committee it made short work of its task we sent for the police to tell us where they had trouble with the boys and why it was always the same story they had no other place to play in than the street and there they broke windows so began the trouble it ended in the police station and the jail the city was building new schools by the score we got a list of the sites and as we expected they were where the trouble was worst naturally so that was where the children were there then was our field as a playground committee why not kill two birds with one stone and save money by making them one by hitching the school and the boys play together we should speedily get rid of the truant he was just there as a protest against the school without play we asked the board of education to make their school playgrounds the neighborhood recreation centres so they would not need to worry over how big they should be but just make them as big as they could whether on the roof or on the ground they listened but found difficulties in the property odd isn't it this disposition of the world to forever make of the means the end to glorify the establishment it was the same story when i asked them to open the schools at night and let in the boys to have their clubs there the saloon was bidding for them and bidding high but the school board hesitated because a window might be broken or a janitor want extra pay for cleaning up before a reluctant consent was given i had to make a kind of promise that i would not appear before the board again to argue for throwing the doors wider still but it isn't going to keep me from putting in the heaviest licks i can in the campaign that is coming for turning the schools over to the people bodily and making of them the neighbourhood centre in all things that make for good including trades union meetings and political discussions only so shall we make of our schools real cornerstones of our liberties so also we shall through neighbourhood pride restore some of the neighbourhood feeling the home feeling that is now lacking in our cities to our grievous loss half the tenement house population is always moving and to the children the word home has no meaning anything that will help change that will be a great gain and that old board is gone long since anyhow the club prevailed in the end at least one school let it in and though the boys did break a window-pane that winter with a ball they paid for it like men and that ghost was laid the school playground holds aloof yet from the neighbourhood except in the long vacation but that last is something and the rest is coming it could not be coming by any better road than the vacation schools which are paving the way for common sense everywhere everything takes ten years said abram s hewitt when he took his seat as the chairman of the small parks committee ten years before when he was mayor 
he had put through the law under which the mulberry bend had been at last wiped out we held our meetings at the city hall where i had been spurned so often all things come to those who wait and fight for them yes fight i say it advisedly i have come to the time of life when a man does not lay about him with a club unless he has to but eternal vigilance is the price of liberty to be vigilant is to sit up with a club we as a people have provided in the republic a means of fighting for our rights and getting them and it is our business to do it we shall never get them in any other way colonel waring was a wise man as well as a great man his declaration that he cleaned the streets of new york all prophecies to the contrary notwithstanding by putting a man instead of a voter behind every broom deserves to be put on the monument we shall build by and by to that courageous man for it is the whole gospel of municipal righteousness in a nutshell but he never said anything better than when he advised his fellow citizens to fight not to plead for their rights so we grow the kind of citizenship that sets the world or anyhow our day ahead we will all hail the day when we shall be able to lay down the club but until it comes i do not see that we have any choice but to keep a firm grip on it End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the making of an american by jacob a rees this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen i try to go to the war for the third and last time that which i have described as sitting up with a club in a city like new york is bound to win your fight if you sit up long enough for it is to be remembered that the politicians who oppose good government are not primarily concerned about keeping you out of your rights they want the things that make for their advantage first of all the offices through which they can maintain their grip after that they will concede as many of the things you want as they have to and if you are not yourself out for the offices more than otherwise though never more than you wring out of them they really do not care if you do have clean streets good schools parks playgrounds and all the things which make for good citizenship because they give the best part of the man a chance though they grudge them as a sad waste of money that may be turned to use in strengthening the organization which is the sum of all their self-seeking being their means of ever getting more and more hence it is that a mere handful of men and women who rarely or never had other authority than their own unselfish purpose have in all times even the worst been able to put their stamp upon the community for good i am thinking of the felix adlers the dr rainsfords the josephine shaw lowells the robert ross mcburneys the r fulton cuttings the father doyles the jacob h schiffs the robert w de forests the arthur von Briesens, the f norton goddards the richard watson gilders and their kind and thinking of them brings to mind an opportunity i had a year or two ago to tell a club of workmen what i thought of them it was at the chicago commons i had looked in on a sunday evening upon a group of men engaged in what seemed to me a singularly unprofitable discussion of human motives they were of the school which professes to believe that everything proceeds from the love of self and they spoke learnedly of the ego and all that but as i listened the conviction grew along with the feeling of exasperation that sort of nonsense always arouses in me that they were just vaporing and i told them so i pointed to these men and women i have spoken of some of them of great wealth the thing against which they seemed to have a special grudge and told them how they had given their lives and their means in the cause of humanity without asking other reward than that of seeing the world grow better and the hard lot of some of their fellow-men eased wherein they had succeeded because they thought less of themselves than of their neighbours and were in the field anyway to be of such use as they could i told them how distressed i was that upon their own admission they should have been engaged in this discussion four years without getting any farther and i closed with a remorseful feeling of having said more than i intended and perhaps having made them feel bad but not they 
They had listened to me throughout with undisturbed serenity. When I had done, the chairman said courteously that they were greatly indebted to me for my frank opinion. Every man was entitled to his own, and he could quite sympathize with me in my inability to catch their point of view. "'Because here,' he added, "'I have been reading for ten years or more the things Mr. Rees writes in his newspaper and in the magazines, and by which he makes a living, and for the life of me I never was able to understand how any one could be found to pay for such stuff. So there you have my measure as a reformer. The meeting nodded gravely. I was apparently the only one there who took it as a joke. I spoke of the women's share in the progress we made. A good big one it was. We should have been floundering yet in the educational mud-puddle we were in, had it not been for the women of New York, who went to Albany and literally held up the legislature, compelling it to pass our reform bill. And not once, but a dozen times, during Mayor Strong's administration, when they had wearied of me at the city hall, I was not always a persona grata there with the reform administration, did I find it the part of wisdom to send committees of women instead to plead with the mayor over his five o'clock tea. They could worm a playground or a small park out of him when I should have met with a curt refusal and a virtual invitation to be gone. In his political doldrums the mayor did not have a kindly eye to reformers, but he was not always able to make them out in petticoats. The women prevailed at Albany by the power of fact. They knew, and the legislators did not. They received them up there with an indulgent smile, but it became speedily apparent that they came bristling with information about the schools to which the empty old Tammany boast that New York had the best schools in the world, was not an effective answer. In fact, they came nearer being the worst. I had myself had an experience of that kind when I pointed out in print that an East Side school was so overrun with rats that it was difficult to hear oneself think for their squeaking in the dark playground, when the children were upstairs in their classes. The Board of Estimate and Apportionment, which comprises the important officials of the city government, with the mayor as presiding officer, took umbrage at the statement, and said in plain words that I lied and that there were no rats. That was a piece of unthinking ignorance, for an old schoolhouse without rats in it would be a rare thing anywhere, but it was impertinence, too, of a kind of which I had had so much from the city hall that I decided the time had come for a demonstration. I got me a rat-trap, and prepared to catch one and have it sent to the board, duly authenticated by affidavit, as hailing from Allen Street. But before I could carry out my purpose, the bottom fell out of the Tammany conspiracy of ignorance and fraud, and left us the way clear for three years. So I saved my rat for another time. This fact, which was naturally my own weapon, the contribution I was able to make from my own profession and training, was in reality a tremendously effective club before which nothing could or can stand in the long run. If I can leave that conviction as a legacy to my brother reporters, I shall feel that I have really performed a service. I believe they do not half understand it, or they would waste no printer's ink idly. The school war was an illustration of it all through. I was at police headquarters, where I saw the east side, that had been orderly, become thievish and immoral. Going to the schools, I found them overcrowded, ill-ventilated, dark, without playgrounds, repellent. Following up the boys, who escaped from them in disgust, if indeed they were not barred out, the street swarmed with children for whom there was not room. I saw them herded at the prison to which Protestant truants were sent, with burglars, vagrants, thieves, and bad boys of every kind. They classified them according to size, four feet, four feet seven, and over four feet seven. No other way was attempted. At the Catholic prison they did not even do that. They kept them on a footing of social equality, by mixing them all up together. And when, in amazement, I asked if that was doing right by the truant who might be reasonably supposed to be in special danger from such contact. The answer I got was, Would it be fair to the burglar to set him apart with the stamp on him? 
I went back to the office and took from the rogues gallery a handful of photographs of boy thieves and murderers and printed them in the century magazine with a statement of the facts under the heading the making of thieves in new york i quote the concluding sentence of that article because it seemed to me then and it seems to me now that there was no getting away from its awful arraignment while we are asking at this end of the line if it would be quite fair to the burglar to shut him off from social intercourse with his betters, the state reformatory, where the final product of our schools of crime is garnered, supplies the answer year after year unheeded. Of the thousands who land there, barely one per cent kept good company before coming. All the rest were the victims of evil association, of corrupt environment, they were not thieves by heredity. They were made, and the manufacture goes on every day. The street and the jail are the factories. Upon the lay mind the argument took hold. That of the official educator resisted it stubbornly for a season. Two years later, when one of the school commissioners spoke indulgently of the burglars and highway robbers in the two prisons as probably guilty merely of the theft of a top, or a marble, or maybe a banana, in extenuation of the continued policy of his department, in sending truants there in flat defiance of the state law that forbade the mingling of thieves and truants, the police office had once more to be invoked with its testimony. I had been keeping records of the child crimes that came up in the course of my work that year. They began before the kindergarten age with burglary and ill-tapping highwaymen at six sounds rather formidable but there was no other name for it. Two lads of that age had held up a third and robbed him in the street. At seven and eight there were seven housebreakers and two common thieves. At ten I had a burglar, one boy and four girl thieves, two charged with assault and one with forgery. At eleven four burglars, two thieves with a record, two charged with assault, a highway robber, an habitual liar, and a suicide. At twelve five burglars, three thieves, two drunks, three incendiaries, three arrested for assault, and two suicides. At thirteen, five burglars, one with a record, five thieves, five charged with assault, one drunk, one forger. At fourteen, four burglars, seven thieves, one drunk enough to fight a policeman, six highway robbers, and ten charged with assault. And so on. The street had borne its perfect crop, and they were behind the bars every one, locked in with the boys who had done nothing worse than play hooky. It was a knockout blow. Classification by measurement had ceased at the first broadside. The last gave us the truant school which the law demanded. To make the most of it, we shall apparently have to have a new deal. I tried to persuade the Children's Aid Society to turn its old machinery to this new work. Perhaps the George Junior Republic would do better still. When there is room for every boy on the school bench, and room to toss a ball when he is off it, there will not be much left of that problem to wrestle with. But little or much, the peril of the prison is too great to be endured for a moment. It must have been about that time that I received a letter from an old friend, who was in high glee over a statement in some magazine, that I had evolved a scientific theory as to why boys go to the bad in cities. It was plain that he was as much surprised as he was pleased, and so was I when I heard what it was all about. That which they had pitched upon as science and theory was the baldest recital of the facts as seen from Mulberry Street. Beyond putting two and two together, there was very little reasoning about it that such conditions as were all about us should result in making toughs of the boys was not strange. Rather, it would have been strange had anything else come of it. With the home corrupted by the tenement, the school doors closed against them where the swarms were densest, and the children thrown upon the street, there to take their chance. With honest play interdicted, every natural right of the child turned into a means of oppression, a game of ball became a crime for which children were thrust into jail, indeed shot down like dangerous criminals when running away from the policemen who pursued them. 
with dead-letter laws on every hand breeding blackmail and bringing the police and authority into disrepute with the lawlessness of the street added to want of rule at home where the immigrant father looked on helpless himself dependent in the strange surroundings upon the boy and no longer his master it seemed as if we had set out to deliberately make the trouble under which we groaned and we were not alone in it the shoe fits every large city more or less snugly i know for i have had a good deal to do with fitting it on the last two or three years and often when looking my audience over in lecturing about tony and his hardships i am thinking about mulberry street and the old days when problems civic or otherwise were farthest from my mind in digging out the facts that lay ready to the hand of the police reporter in him as a reporter there may be no special virtue but there is that in his work in the haste and the directness of it which compels him always to take the short cut and keeps it clear of crankery of every kind the isms have no place in a newspaper office certainly not in mulberry street i confess i was rather glad of it i had no stomach for abstract discussions of social wrongs i wanted to write those of them that i could reach i wanted to tear down the mulberry bend and let in the light so that we might the more readily make them out the others could do the rest then i used to say that to a very destructive crank who would have nothing less upon any account than the whole loaf my remedies were an abomination to him the landlords should be boiled in oil to a man hanging was too good for them now he is a tammany office-holder in a position where propping up landlord greed is his daily practice and privilege and he thrives upon it but i ought not to blame him it is precisely because of his kind that tammany is defenceless against real reform it never can make it out that every man has his language is the language of fourteenth street they have no dictionary there to enable them to understand any other and as a short cut out of it they deny that there is any other it helped me vastly that my associations in the office were most congenial i have not often been in accord with the editorial page of my own paper the sun it seemed as if it were impossible for anybody to get farther apart in their views of most things on the earth and off it than were my paper and i it hated and persecuted beecher and cleveland they were my heroes it converted me to grant by its opposition to him the sign keep off the grass arouses in its editorial breast no desire to lock up the man who planted it it does in mine ten years and more i have striven in its columns to make the tenement out a chief device of the devil and it must be that i have brought some over to my belief but i have not converted the sun so that on the principle which i laid down before that i must be always fighting with my friends i ought to have had a mighty good time of it there and so in fact i did they let me have in pretty nearly everything my own way though it led us so far apart as time passed and the duties that came to me took more and more of my time from my office work i found that end of it insensibly lightened to allow me to pursue the things i believed in though they did not no doubt the old friendship that existed between my immediate chief on the evening sun william mccloy and myself bore a hand in this yet it could not have gone on without the assent and virtual sympathy of the danas father and son for we came now and then to a point where opposite views clashed and proved irreconcilable then i found these men whom some deemed cynical most ready to see the facts as they were and to see justice done i like to think of my last meeting with charles a dana the old chief as he was always called in the office in all the years i was on the sun i do not think i had spoken with him a half dozen times when he wanted anything of me personally his orders were very brief and to the point it was generally something a report to be digested or the story of some social experiment which showed me that in his heart he was faithful to his early love he had been in his youth as everybody knows an enthusiastic reformer a member of the brook farm community but if he thought i saw he let no sign escape him 
He hated shams. Perhaps I was on trial all the time. If so, I believe that he meant to tell me in that last handshake that he had not found me wanting. It was on the stairs in the sun office that we met. I was going up, he was coming down, going home to die. He knew it. In me there was no suspicion of the truth when I came upon him at the turn of the stairs, stumbling along in a way very unlike the usual springy step of the old chief. I hardly knew him when he passed, but as he turned and held out his hand, I saw that it was Mr. Dana, looking somewhat older than I had ever seen him, and changed. I took off my hat, and we shook hands. "'Well,' he said, "'have you reformed everything to suit you, straightened out every kink in town?' "'Pretty nearly,' I said, falling into his tone of banter. "'All except the sun office. That is left yet, and as bad as ever.' "'Ha!' he laughed. "'You come on. We are ready for you. Come right along.' And with another hearty handshake he was gone. He never saw the sun office again. It was the only time he had ever held out his hand to me, after that first meeting of ours when I was a lonely lad, nearly thirty years before. That time there was a dollar in it, and I spurned it. This time I liked to believe his heart was in it, and I took it gladly and gratefully. The police helped, sometimes. More frequently we were at odds, and few enough in the rank and file understood that I was fighting for them in fighting the department. A friend came into my office, laughing, one day, and told me that he had just overheard the doorman at police headquarters say, as he saw me pass, "'Ugh! The hypocrite! See him take off his hat, and then lay us out cold in his paper when he gets the chance!' He referred to my old country habit of raising the hat in salutation, instead of merely nodding or touching the brim. No doubt he expressed a feeling that was quite general at the time but after Mulberry Street had taken notice of Roosevelt's friendship for me, there was a change, and then it went to the other extreme. It never quite got over the fact that he did not ring me in on President McKinley and the government, or at least make me his private secretary and deputy boss of the Empire State while he was governor. The Mulberry Street idea of friendship includes the loaves and fishes first and last, and pull is the joss it worships. In fact, I had several times to explain that Mr. Roosevelt had not gone back on me to save his political reputation. When at a public meeting he once spoke of me as his friend, a dozen policemen brought me copies of the paper containing the notice, with a frankly expressed wish to be remembered when I came into my own. About that time, being in the neighborhood, I strayed into the bend one day to enjoy the sunlight there and the children sporting in it. At the curb stood a big policeman leisurely peeling an orange, to which he had helped himself from a cringing Italian's cart. I asked him how were things in the bend since the park had come. He eyed me very coldly and said, Bad, very bad. At that I expressed my astonishment, saying that I was a reporter at police headquarters and had understood differently. "'What paper?' he grunted insolently. I told him. He bestowed a look of mingled pity and contempt upon me. "'Nix, mine friend,' he said, spreading his feet farther apart and tossing the peel at the Italian, who grinned with delight at such condescension. I regarded him expectantly. He was a very aggravating chap. "'Did you say you were at police headquarters? For the sun?' he observed at length. "'Yes.' He shook his head. "'Nixy, not guilty,' he said tauntingly. "'Why, what do you mean?' "'Haven't you heard of Mr. Reese, Jacob Reese?' I said I had. "'The governor's friend?' "'Yes, what of it?' "'Well, ain't he at headquarters for the sun?' I said that was so. "'Well?' I took out my card and handed it to him. "'I am that man,' I said. For a fraction of a second the policeman's jaw dropped. But he was a thoroughbred. His heels came together before, as it seemed, he could have read my name. He straightened up. The half-peeled orange fell from his hand and rolled into the gutter, covertly speeded by a dexterous little kick. The unhappy Italian, believing it a mishap, made haste to select the biggest and juiciest fruit on his stand, 
and held it out with a propitiatory bow, but he spurned him haughtily away. "'These dagoes,' he said, elaborately placing my card in the sweatband of his hat, "'ain't got no manners. It's a hard place for a good man down here. It's time I was a roundsman. You can do it. You've got to pull.' When Roosevelt had gone to Washington to help fit out the Navy for the war with Spain, I spent a part of the winter there with him, and Mulberry Street took it for granted that I had at last been placed, as I should have been long before. There was great amazement when I came back to take my old place. The truth was that I had gone partly to observe what went on at the Capitol for my paper, and partly to speed on the war, in which I was a hearty believer from the first. It was to me a means, first and last, of ending the murder in Cuba. One of the very earliest things I had to do with as a reporter was the Virginius Massacre, and ever since it had been bloodshed right along. It was time to stop it, and the only way seemed to wrest the grip of Spain from the throat of the island. I think I never quite got over the contempt I conceived for Spain and Spanish ways when I read as a boy, in Hans Christian Andersen's account, of his travels in the country of the dons, that the shepherds brought butter from the mountains in sheep's intestines, and measured them off in lengths demanded by the customers, by tying knots upon them. What was to be expected from a country that sold butter by the yard? As the event showed, it ran its navies after the same fashion, and was justly punished. I made friends that winter with Dr. Leonard Wood, whom we all came to know and admire afterwards as General and Governor Wood, and a fine fellow he was. He was Roosevelt's friend and physician, and we spent many strenuous hours together, being in that mood. For the third time in my life, and the last, I wanted to go to the war, when they went, and oh, so badly. Not to fight, I had had all I needed of that at home, but to tell the truth about what was going on in Cuba. The outlook offered me that post, and the sun agreed heartily. But once more the door was barred against me. Two of my children had scarlet fever, my oldest son had gone to Washington, trying to enlist with the Rough Riders, and the one next in line was engineering to get into the Navy on his own hook. My wife raised no objection to my going, if it was duty, but her tears fell silently, and I stayed. It was three times and out. I shall never go to the war now unless in defence of my own home, which may God forbid. Within a year I knew that, had I gone then, I should most likely not have returned. I had received notice that to my dreams of campaigning in that way there was an end. Thankful that I had been spared, I yet took leave of them with a sigh. Most illogically, for I hate the sight of human suffering and of brutal passions aroused. But deep down in my heart, there is the horror of my Viking forefathers, of dying in bed, unable to strike back, as it were. I know it is wicked and foolish, but all my life I have so wished to get on a horse with a sword, and slam in just once, like another Sheridan. I, who cannot sit on a horse! Even the one Roosevelt got me at Montauk, that was warranted not to bite or scratch, ran away with me. So it is foolishness, plain to see. Yet, so I might have found out which way I would really have run when the call came. I do hope the right way, but I never have felt quite sure. The casualties of war are not all on the battlefield. The Cuban campaign wrecked a promising career as a foreign correspondent, which I had been building up for some ten or fifteen years, with toilsome effort. It was for a Danish newspaper I wrote with much approval, but when the war came they did not take the same view of things that I did, and fell to suppressing or mutilating my letters, whereupon our connection ceased abruptly. My letters were, explained the editor to me a year or two later, when I saw him in Copenhagen, so, er, uh, ultra-patriotic, so, er, uh, youthful in their enthusiasm, that, huh! I interrupted him with the remark that I was glad we were young enough yet, in my country, to get up and shout for the flag in a fight, and left him to think it over. They must have aged suddenly over there, for they were not that way when I was a boy. The real fact was that somehow they could not get it into their heads that a European bully could be whipped in one round by the States. 
They insisted on printing ridiculous dispatches about Spanish victories. I think there was something about codfish, too. Something commercial about corks and codfish, Iceland keeping Spain on a fish diet in Lent, in return for which she corked the Danish beer. I have forgotten the particulars. The bottom fact was a distrust of the United States that was based upon a curiously stubborn ignorance, entirely without excuse in a people of high intelligence like the Danes. I tried hard as a correspondent to draw a reasonable human picture of American affairs, but it seemed to make no impression. They would jump at the Munchausen stories that are always afloat, as if America were some sort of menagerie and not a Christian country. I think nothing ever aggravated me as did an instance of that kind the year Ben Butler ran for the presidency. I had been trying in my letters to present the political situation and issues fairly, and was beginning to feel that they must understand, when I received a copy of my paper from Copenhagen and read there a Life of General Butler, which condensed ran something like this. Mr. Butler was an ambitious young lawyer, shrewd and full of bold schemes for enriching himself. When the war with the South broke out, he raised all the money he could and fitted out a fleet of privateers. With this he sailed for New Orleans, captured the city, and, collecting all the silver spoons it contained, freighted his vessel with them and returned to the north. Thus he laid the foundation for his great fortune, but achieved lasting unpopularity in the south, which will prevent his election to the presidency. I am not joking. That was how the story of the silver spoons looked in Danish a quarter of a century after the war. Really, now, what would you have done? I laughed and, well, made remarks by turns, and in the end concluded that there was nothing else that could be done except buckle to and try again, which I did. If I could not go to the war, I could at least go electioneering with Roosevelt when he came back, and try to help him out the best I knew how, in matters that touched the poor and their life, once he sat in Cleveland's chair in Albany. I do not think he felt that as an added dignity, but I did, and I told him so, whereat he used to laugh a little. But there was nothing to laugh at. They are men of the same stamp, not saints any more than the rest of us but men with minds and honest wills, if they have different ways of doing things. I wish some Cleveland would come along again soon, and give me another chance to vote the ticket which Tammany obstructs with its impudent claim that it is the Democratic Party. As for Roosevelt, few were nearer to him, I fancy, than I, even at Albany. No doubt he made his mistakes like the rest of us, and when he did there were not wanting critics to make the most of it. I wish they had been half as ready to lend him a hand. We might have been farther on the road then. I saw how faithfully he laboured. I was his umpire with the tailors, with the drug clerks, in the enforcement of the factory law against sweaters, and I know that early and late he had no other thought than how best to serve the people who trusted him. I want no better governor than that, and I guess we shall want him a long time before we get one as good. I found out upon our electioneering tours that I was not a good stump speaker, especially on the wing with five-minute stops of the train. It used to pull out with me inwardly raging all the good things I meant to say unsaid. The politicians knew that trick better, and I left the field to them speedily. Thereafter I went along just for company. Only two or three times did I rise to the occasion. Once, when I spoke in the square at Jamestown, New York, where I had worked as a young lad, and trapped muskrats in the creek for a living, the old days came back to me as I looked upon that mighty throng, and the cheers that arose from it told me that I had caught on. I was wondering whether, by any chance, the old ship captain who finished me as a lecturer once was in it. But he was not. He was dead. Another time was in Flushing, Long Island. There was not room in the hall, and they sent me out to talk to the crowd in the street. The sight of it, with the flickering torchlight upon the sea of upturned faces, took me somehow as nothing ever had, and the speech I made from the steps, propped up by two policemen, took the crowd too. It cheered so that Roosevelt within stopped and thought some enemy had captured the meeting. When he was gone, with the spirit still upon me, I talked to the meeting in the hall till it rose and shouted, 
my political pet enemy from richmond hill was on the platform and came over to embrace me we have been friends since the memory of that evening lingers yet in flushing i am told a picture from that day's trip through long island will ever abide on my mind the train was about to pull out from the station in greenport when the public school children came swarming down to see teddy he leaned out from the rear platform grasping as many of the little hands as he could while the train hands did their best to keep the track clear way back in the jostling cheering crowd i made out the slim figure of a pale freckled little girl in a worn garment struggling eagerly but hopelessly to get near him the stronger children pushed her farther back and her mournful face was nearly the last of them all when roosevelt saw her going down the steps even as the train started he made a quick dash clearing a path through the surging tide to the little girl and taking her hand gave it the heartiest shake of all then sprinted for the departing car and caught it the last i saw of greenport was the poor little girl holding tight the hand her hero had shaken with her face all one sunbeam of joy i know just how she felt for i have had the same experience one of the things i remember with a pleasure which the years have no power to dim is my meeting with cardinal gibbons some years ago they had asked me to come to baltimore to speak for the fresh air fund and to my great delight i found that the cardinal was to preside i had always admired him at a distance but during the fifteen minutes talk we had before the lecture he won my heart entirely he asked me to forgive him if he had to go away before i finished my speech for he had had a very exhausting service the day before and i am an old man on the sunny side of sixty he added as if in apology on the shady side you mean amended the presbyterian clergyman who was on the committee the cardinal shook his head smiling no doctor the sunny side nearer heaven the meeting was of a kind to inspire even the dullest speaker when i finished my plea for the children and turned around there sat the cardinal yet behind me though it was an hour past his bedtime he came forward and gave me his blessing then and there i was never so much touched and moved even my mother staunch old lutheran that she is was satisfied when i told her of it though in the nature of things the idea of her son consorting in that way with principalities and powers in the enemy's camp must have been a shock to her speaking of which reminds me of the one brief glimpse into the mysteries of the universe i had while in galesburg illinois the same year i had been lecturing at knox college of which my friend john finley was the president it rained before the meeting but when we came out the stars shone brightly and i was fired with a sudden desire to see them through the observatory telescope the professor of astronomy took me into the dark dome and pointed the glass at saturn which i knew as a scintillating point of light said to be a big round ball like our earth and had taken on trust as a matter of course but to see it hanging there, white and big as an apple, suspended within its broad and shining ring, was a revelation before which I stood awe-stricken and dumb. I gazed and gazed. Between the star and its ring I caught the infinite depth of black space beyond. I seemed to see almost the whirl, the motion, to hear the morning stars sing together, and then, like a flash, it was gone. Crane my neck on my ladder as I might, I could not get sight of it. "'But where did she go?' I said, half to myself. Far down in the darkness came the old professor's deep voice. "'That time you saw the earth move.' And so I did. The clockwork that made the dome keep up with the motion of the stars, of our world, rather, had run down, and when Saturn passed out of my sight, as I thought, it was the earth instead which I literally saw move and now that i am on my travels let me cross the ocean long enough to say that my digging among the london slums one summer only served to convince me that their problem is the same as ours and is to be solved along the same lines they have their ways and we have ours and each has something to learn from the other we copied our law that enabled us to tear down slum tenements from the english statute under which they cleared large areas over yonder long before we got to work 
and yet in their poor streets, in Christian Street, of all places, I found families living in apartments entirely below the sidewalk grade. I found children, poisoned by factory fumes in a charitable fold, and people huddled in sleeping-rooms as I had never seen it in New York. And when I asked why the police did not interfere, they looked at me uncomprehending, and retorted that they were on their own premises, the factory too, and where did the police come in? I told them that in New York they came in when and where they saw fit, and systematically in the middle of the night, so that they might get at the exact facts. As for our cave-dwellers, we had got rid of them a long time since, by the simple process of dragging out those who wouldn't go, and shutting the cellar doors against them. It had to be done, and it was done, and it settled the matter. "'I thought yours was a free country,' said my policeman conductor. "'So it is,' I told him. "'Freedom to poison yourself, and your neighbour accepted.' He shook his head, and we went on. But these were mere divergences of practice. The principle is not affected. It was clear enough that in London, as in New York, it was less a question of transforming human nature in the tenant than of reforming it in the landlord. At St. Giles I found side by side with the workhouse a church, a big bath and wash-house, and a school. It was the same at Seven Dials. At every step it recalled the five points. To the one as to the other, steeped in poverty and crime, had come the road-builder, the missionary, the school-teacher, and let light in together. And in their track was following, rather faster there than here as yet, the housing reformer with his atoning scheme of philanthropy and five per cent. That holds the key. In the last analysis, it is a question of how we rate the brotherhood, what per cent we will take. My neighbour at table in my London boarding-house meant that, though he put it in a way all his own. He was a benevolent enough crank, but no friend of preaching. Being a crank, he condemned preachers with one fell swoop. The parsons, he said, my evings, what are they? In hall me life, I've known only two that were fit to be in the pulpit. Returning to my own country, I found the conviction deepening wherever the slum had got a grip, that it was the problem not only of government, but of humanity. In Chicago they are setting limits to it with parks and playgrounds and the home restored. In Cincinnati, in Cleveland, in Boston, they are bestirring themselves. Indeed, in Boston they have torn down more foul tenements than did we in the metropolis, and with less surrender to the slum landlord. In New York a citizens' movement paved the way for the last tenement house commission, which has just finished its great work and the movement is warrant that the fruits of that work will not be lost. Listen to the arraignment of the tenement by that commission appointed by the State. All the conditions which surround childhood, youth, and womanhood in New York's crowded tenement quarters make for unrighteousness. They also make for disease. From the tenements there comes a stream of sick, helpless people to our hospitals and dispensaries, from them also comes a host of paupers and charity-seekers. Most terrible of all, the fact that, mingled with the drunken, the dissolute, the improvident, the diseased, dwell the great mass of the respectable working men of the city with their families. This, after all, the work of twenty years. Yet the work was not wasted, for at last we see the truth seeing it is impossible that the monstrous wrong should go unrighted and government of the people endure as endure it will i know we have only begun to find out what it can do for mankind in the day when we shall all think enough about the common good the race publica to forget about ourselves in that day too the boss shall have ceased from troubling however gross he wax in our sight he has no real substance he is but an ugly dream of political distemper. Sometimes, when I hear him spoken of with bated breath, I think of the Irish teamster who went to the priest in a fright. He had seen a ghost on the church wall as he passed it in the night. "'And what was it like?' asked the priest. "'It was nothing so much as a big ass,' said Patrick, wide-eyed. "'Go home, Pat, and be easy. You've seen your own shadow.' but I am tired now, and want to go home to mother, and rest a while. 
End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of the Making of an American by Jacob A. Rees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 When I Went Home to Mother There was a heavy step on the stairs, a rap that sounded much as if an elephant had knocked against the jam in passing, and there in the door stood a six-foot giant, calmly surveying me, as if I were a specimen bug stuck on a pin for inspection instead of an ordinary man-person with no more than two legs. "'Well,' I said, groping helplessly among the memories of the past for a clue to the apparition. Somewhere and some time I had seen it before. That much I knew, and no more. The shape took a step into the room. "'I am Jess,' it said simply. "'Jess Jepson, from Lustrup.' "'Lustrup!' I pushed back papers and pen and strode toward the giant to pull him up to the light. Lustrup! Talk about seven-league boots! That stride of mine was four thousand miles long, if it was a foot. It spanned the stormy Atlantic and the cold North Sea, and set me down in sight of the little village of straw-thatched farmhouses, where I played in the long ago, right by the dam in the lazy brook, where buttercups and forget-me-nots nodded ever over the pool and the pewit built its nest in spring. Just beyond, the brook issued forth from the meadows to make a detour around the sunken walls of the old manse and lose itself in the moor that stretched toward the western hills. Lustrup! Oh, yes! I pushed my giant into a chair so that I might have a look at him. He was just like the landscape of his native plain, big and calm and honest. Nothing there to hide. Couldn't if it tried and, like his village, he smelled of the barnyard. He was a driver, he told me, earning wages. But he had his evenings to himself, and so he had come to find, through me, a school where he might go and learn English. Just so. It was Lustrup all over. I remembered as though it were yesterday, the time I went up to have a look at the dam I hadn't seen for thirty years, and the sunfish and the pewit so anxiously solicitous for her young, and found the brook turned aside and the western earth wall of the manse, which it skirted, all gone. And the story the big farmer, Jess Jepson's father, told me with such quiet pride, standing there, of how because of trouble made by the Germans at the line a mile away the cattle business had run down and down until the farm didn't pay. How he and the boy, unaided, working patiently year by year with spade and shovel, had dug down the nine acres of dry upland, moved the wall into the bottoms, and turned the brook, making green meadow of the sandy barren, and saving the farm. The toil of twenty years had broken the old man's body, but his spirit was undaunted as ever. There was a gleam of triumph in his eye as he shook his fist at the line-post on the causeway. "'We beat them,' he said. "'We did.' "'They did.' I had heard it told many times how this brave little people, driven out of the German market, had conquered the English and held it against the world, three times in one man's lifetime, making a new front to changed industrial conditions, turning from grain-raising to cattle on the hoof, again to slaughtered meat, and once more to dairy farming, and holding always their own. How, robbed of one-third of their country by a faithless foe, they had set about with indomitable energy to reclaim the arid moor, and in one generation laid under the plough or planted as woodland as great an area as that which had been stolen from them. Ay, it was a brave record, a story to make one proud of being of such a people. I, too, heard the pewit's plaint in my childhood, and caught the sunfish in the brook. I was a boy when they planted the black post at the line and watered it with the blood of my countrymen. Grey-haired and with old-time roots in a foreign soil, I dream with them yet of the day that shall see it pulled up and hurled over the river, where my fathers beat back the southern tide a thousand years. Jess, he went away satisfied. He will be there when needed. His calm eyes warranted that. And I? I went back to the old home, to Denmark and to my mother, 
because I just couldn't stay away any longer. We had wandered through Holland, counting the windmills, studying the explications set forth in painfully elaborate English on its old church walls, with the information for travellers that further particulars were to be obtained of the sexton, who might be found with the key in the neighbourhood number five. We had argued with the keeper of the Prinzenhof in Delft that William the Silent could not possibly have been murdered as he said he was, that he must have come down the stairs and not gone across the hall when the assassin shot him, as any New York police reporter could tell from the bullet hole that is yet in the wall, and thereby wounding his patriotic pride so deeply that an extra fee was required to soothe it. I caught him looking after us as we went down the street and shaking his head at those wild Americans who accounted nothing holy, not even the official record of murder, done while their ancestors were yet savages roaming the plains. We had laughed at the coal-heavers on the frontier, carrying coal in baskets up a ladder to the waiting engine, and emptying it into the fender. And now, after parting company with my fellow traveller at Hamburg, I was nearing the land where, once more, I should see old Donnebrog, the flag that fell from heaven with victory to the hard-pressed Danes. Literally out of the sky it fell in their sight, the historic fact being apparently that the Christian bishops had put up a job with the Pope to wean the newly converted Danes away from their heathen pirate flag, and found their opportunity in one of the crusades the Danes undertook on their own hook into what is now Prussia. The Pope had sent a silken banner with the device of a white cross in red, and at the right moment, when the other was taken, the priest threw it down from a cliff into the thick of the battle, and turned its tide. Ever after, it was the flag of the Danes, and their German foes had reason to hate it. Here in Schleswig, through which I was travelling, to display it was good cause for banishment but over yonder, beyond the black post, it was waiting, and my heart leaped to meet it. Have I not felt the thrill, when wandering abroad, at the sight of the stars and stripes suddenly unfolding, the flag of my home, of my manhood's years, and of my pride? Happy he who has a flag to love, twice blessed he who has two, and such two. We have yet a mile to the frontier, and, with the panorama of green meadows, of placid rivers, and of long-legged storks gravely patrolling the marshes in search of frogs and lizards, passing by our car window, I can stop to tell you how this filial pride in the flag of my fathers once betrayed me into the hands of the Philistines. It was in London, during the wedding of the Duke of York. The king and queen of Denmark were in town, and wherever one went was the Danish flag hung out in their honour. Riding under one, on top of a Holborn bus, I asked a cockney in the seat next to mine what flag it was. I wanted to hear him praise it, that was why I pretended not to know. He surveyed it with the calm assurance of his kind, and made reply. That, ah, yes, it is the sign of St. John's Ambulance Corps the accident flag, don't you know? And he pointed to an ambulance officer, just passing with the cross device on his arm. The Dunnebrog, the accident flag. What did I do? What would you have done? I just fumed and suppressed as well as I could a desire to pitch that cockney into the crowds below, with his pipe and his miserable ignorance. But I had to go down to do it. But there is the hoary tower of the old Domkirk, in which I was baptized and confirmed and married, rising out of the broad fields, and all the familiar landmarks rushing by, and now the train is slowing up for the station, and a chorus of voices shout out the name of the wanderer. There is mother in the throng with the glad tears streaming down her dear old face, and half the town come out to see her bring home her boy, every one of them sharing her joy, to the very letter-carrier who brought her his letters these many years, and has grown fairly to be a member of the family in the doing of it. At last the waiting is over, and her faith justified. Dear old mother, grey-haired I return, sadly scotched in many a conflict with the world, yet ever thy boy, thy home mine. Ah, me! Heaven is nearer to us than we often dream on earth. 
How shall I tell you of the old town by the North Sea, that was the home of the Danish kings, in the days when kings led their armies afield, and held their crowns by the strength of their grip? Shall I paint to you the queer, crooked streets with their cobblestone pavements, and tile-roofed houses, where the swallow builds in the hall and the stork on the ridge-pole, witness both that peace dwells within? For it is well known that the stork will not abide with a divided house, and as for the swallow, a plague of boils awaits the graceless hand that disturbs its nest. When the Saviour hung upon the cross, did it not perch upon the beam and pour forth its song of love and pity to his dying ear? Soothe him, soothe him! The stork from the meadow cried, Strength him, strength him! But the wicked Pewit, beholding the soldiers with their spears, cried, Pierce him, pierce him! Hence stork and swallow are the friends of man, while the Pewit dwells in exile, fleeing ever from his presence with its lonesome cry. Will you wander with me through the fields where the blue-fringed gentian blooms with the pink bell-heather, and the bridal torch nods from the brookside, bending its stately head to the west wind that sweeps ever in from the sea with touch as soft as of a woman's hand? Flat and uninteresting? Yes, if you will, if one sees only the fields. My children saw them and longed back to the hills of Long Island, and in their cold looks I felt the tugging of the chain which he must bear through life, who exiled himself from the land of his birth, however near to his heart that of his choice and his adoption. I played in these fields when I was a boy. I fished in these streams, and built fires on their banks in spring, to roast potatoes in, the like of which I have never tasted since. Here I lay dreaming of the great and beautiful world without, watching the skylark soar ever higher, with its song of triumph and joy, and here I learned the sweet lesson of love that has echoed its jubilant note through all the years, and will until we reach the golden gate, she and I, to which love holds the key. Uninteresting, say you so? But linger here with me, casting for pickerel among the water-lilies, until the sun sets red and big over the sea yonder, and you shall see a light upon these meadows where the grass is as fine silk, that is almost as if it were not of earth. And as we walk home through the long northern twilight, listening to the curfew's distant call, with the browsing sheep looming large against the horizon upon the green hill, where stood the old king's castle, and the grey dome rearing its lofty head over their graves, teeming with memories of centuries gone past, you shall learn to know the poetry of this Danish summer, that holds the hearts of its children with hoops of steel. At the south gate the gossip benches are filled. The old men smoke their pipes and doff their caps to the American, with the cheery welcome of friends who knew and spanked him, with hearty good will when, as a kid, he absconded with their boats for a surreptitious expedition up to the lake. Those boats, heavy, flat-bottomed, propelled with a pole that stuck in the mud, and pulled them back half the time farther than they had gone. But what fun it was! In after years a steam-whistle woke the echoes of these quiet waters. It was the first one, and the last. The railroad, indeed, came to town, long after I had grown to be a man, and a cotton-mill interjected its bustle into the drowsy hum of the water-wheels that had monopolized the industry of the town before, disturbing its harmony for a season. But the steamboat had no successors. The river that had once borne large ships gradually sanded up at the mouth, and nothing heavier than a one-masted lighter has come up, in the memory of man, to the quay where grass grows high among the cobblestones, and the lone customs official smokes his pipe all day long in unbroken peace. The steamer was a launch of the smallest. It had been brought across country on a wagon. Someone had bought it at an auction for a lark, and a huge lark was its year on the waters of the Neves River. The whole town took a sail in it by turns, always with one aft whose business it was to disentangle the rudder from the mass of seaweed, which with brief intervals suspended progress, and all hands ready to get out and lift the steamer off when it ran on a bank. There came a day when a more than commonly ambitious excursion was undertaken, even to the islands in the sea, some six or seven miles from the town. 
the town council set out upon the journey with the rector of the latin school and the burgomaster bargaining for dinner on their return at dusk but it was destined that those islands should remain undiscovered by steam and the dinner uneaten barely outside the tide left it high and dry upon the sands it was then those danes showed what stuff there was in them the water would not be back to lift them off for six hours and more they indulged in no lamentations but sturdily produced the schnapps and sandwiches without which no dane is easily to be tempted out of sight of his home the rector evolved a pack of cards from the depths of his coat pocket and upon the sand bank the party camped playing a cheerful game of whist until the tide came back and bore them home the night comes on the people are returning from their evening constitutional walking in the middle of the street and taking off their hats to their neighbours as they pass it is their custom and the american habit of nodding to friends is held to be evidence of backwoods manners excusable only in a people so new in the deep recesses of the domkirk dark shadows are gathering the tower clock peals forth at the last stroke the watchman lifts up his chant in a voice that comes quavering down from bygone ages ho oh, watchman heard ye the clock strike ten this hour is worth the knowing ye households high and low the time is here and going when ye to bed should go ask god to guard and say amen be quick and bright watch fire and light our clock just now struck ten i shall take his advice but first i must go to the shoe store to get a box of polish for my russet shoes unexpectedly i found it for sale there i strike the storekeeper in an ungracious mood he objects to being bothered about business just when he is shutting up shop there he says handing me the desired box only one more left i shall presently have to send for more twice already i have been put to that trouble i don't know what has come over the town and he slams down the shutter with a fretful jerk i grope my way home in egyptian darkness thanking in my heart the town council for its forethought in painting the lamp-posts white it was when a dispute sprang up about the price of gas or something danish disputes are like the law the world over slow of gait and it was in no spirit of mockery that a resolution was passed to paint the lamp-posts white pending the controversy so that the good people in the town might avoid running against them in the dark and getting hurt if by any mischance they strayed from the middle of the road bright and early the next morning i found women at work sprinkling white sand in the street in front of my door and strewing it with winter green and twigs of hemlock some one was dead and the funeral was to pass that way indeed they all did the cemetery was at the other end of the street it was one of the inducements held out to my mother she told me when father died to move from the old home into that street now that she was quite alone it was so nice and lively all the funerals passed by the one buried that day i had known or she had known me in my boyhood and it was expected that i would attend my mother sent the wreath that belongs there is both sense and sentiment in flowers at a funeral when they are wreathed by the hands of those who loved the dead as is still the custom here none where they are bought at a florist's and paid for with a growl and we stood around the coffin and sang the old hymns then walked behind it two by two men and women to the grave singing as we passed through the gate earth to earth ashes to ashes dust to dust the clods rang upon the coffin with almost cheerful sound for she whose mortal body lay within was full of years and very tired the minister paused from among the mourners came forth the nearest relative and stood by the grave hat in hand ours were all off from my heart i thank you neighbours all he said and it was over we waited to shake hands to speculate on the weather safe topic even at funerals then went each to his own i went down by the cloister walk and sat upon a bench and thought of it all the stork had built its nest there on the stump of a broken tree and was hatching its young 
the big bird stood on one leg and looked down upon me out of its grave unblinking eye as it did forty years ago when we children sang to it in the street the song about the pyramids and pharaoh's land the town lay slumbering in the sunlight and the blossoming elders the far tinkle of a bell came sleepily over the hedges once upon a time it called the monks to prayers ashes to ashes they are gone and buried with the dead past to-day it summons the latin schoolboys to recitations i shuddered at the thought they had at the school when the bell called me with the rest a wretched tradition that some king had once expressed wonder at the many learned men who came from the latin school and the rector told him why we have near here he said a little birch forest it helps your majesty it helps faithfully did it play its part in my day though i cannot bear witness that it helped but its day passed too and is gone the world moves and all the while forward not always with the speed of the wind but it moves the letter carrier on his collecting rounds with his cart has stopped at the bleaching yard where his wife and little boy are hanging out washing he lights his pipe and after a brief rest to take breath turns to helping the guide wife hang the things on the line then he packs the dry clothes in his cart, puts the boy in with them, and, puffing leisurely at his pipe, lounges soberly homeward. There is no hurry with the mail. There is not. It was only yesterday that, crossing the meadows on a local, I found the train pulling up some distance from the village to let an old woman, coming puffing and blowing from a farmhouse, with a basket on her arm, catch up. "'Well, mother, can she hurry a bit?' spake the conductor when she came within hearing. They address one another in the third person, out of a sort of neighbourly regard, it appears. "'Now, Sonny,' responded the old woman, as she lumbered on board, "'don't I run as fast as I can?' "'And has she got her fare now?' queried the conductor. "'Why, no, Sonny. How should I have that till I've been in to sell my eggs?' And she held up the basket in token of good faith. "'Well, well,' growled the other. See to it that she doesn't forget to pay it when she comes back. And the train went on. Time to wait. The deckhand on the ferry-boat lifts his hat and bids you Godspeed as you pass. The train waits for the conductor to hear the station-master's account of that last baby and his assurance that the mother is doing well. The labourer goes on strike when his right is questioned to stop work to take his glass of beer between meals. The telegraph messenger, meeting the man for whom he has a message, goes back home with him to hear the news. It would not be proper to break it in the street. I remember once, coming down the chain of lakes in the Jutland Peninsula, on a steamer that stopped at an out-of-the-way landing, where no passengers were in waiting. One, a woman, was made out, though, hastening down a path that lost itself in the woods a long way off. The captain waited. As she stepped aboard, another woman appeared in the dim distance, running, too. He blew his whistle to tell her he was waiting, but said nothing. When she was quite near the steamer, a third woman turned into the path, bound, too, for the landing. I looked on in some fear, lest the steamboat man should lose his temper at length. But not he. It was only when a fourth and last woman appeared like a whirling speck in the distance, with the three aboard, making frantic signals to her to hurry, that he showed signs of impatience. "'Couldn't she,' he said, with some asperity, as she flounced aboard, "'couldn't she get here sooner?' "'No,' she said, "'I couldn't. Didn't you see me run?' And he rang the bell to start the boat. Time to wait. In New York I have seen men, in the days before the iron gates were put on the ferry-boats, jump when the boat was yet a yard from the landing and run as if their lives depended on it. Then, meeting an acquaintance in the street, stop and chat ten minutes with him about nothing. How much farther did they get than these? When all Denmark was torn up last summer by a strike that involved three-fourths of the working population, and extended through many months, to the complete blocking of all industries, not a blow was struck or an ill word spoken during all the time, determined as both sides were. No troops or extra police were needed. 
the strikers used the time to attend university extension lectures visit museums and learn something useful the people including many of the employers contributed liberally to keep them from starving it was a war of principles and it was fought out on that line though in the end each gave in to something yes it is good sometimes to take time to think even if you cannot wait for the tide to float you off a sandbank though what else they could have done i cannot imagine that night there was a great to-do in the old town the target company had its annual shoot and the target company included all of the solid citizens of the town the king who had made the best score was escorted with a band to the hotel on the square opposite the dome and made a speech from a window adorned with the green sash of his office and flanked by ten tallow dips by way of illumination and the people cheered yes it was petty and provincial and all that but it was pleasant and neighbourly and oh how good for a tired man when i was rested i journeyed through the islands to find old friends and found them the heartiness of the welcome that met me everywhere no need of their telling me they were glad to see me it shone out of their faces and all over them i shall always remember that journey the people in the cars that were forever lunching and urging me to join in though we had never met before were we not fellow travellers how then could we be strangers and when they learned i was from new york the inquiries after hans or fritz somewhere in nebraska or dakota had i ever met them and if i did would i tell them i had seen father mother or brother and that they were well and would i come and stay with them a day or two it was with very genuine regret that i had mostly to refuse my vacation could not last for ever as it was i packed it full enough to last me for many summers of all sorts of things too shall i ever forget that ride on the stage up the shore road from elsinore which i made outside with the driver a slow-going farmer who had conscientious scruples so it seemed against passing any vehicle on the road and preferred to take the dust of them all until we looked like a pair of dusty millers up there on the box to my protests he turned an incredulous ear remarking only that there was always someone ahead which was a fact when at last we drew near our destination he found himself a passenger short after some puzzled inquiry of the rest he came back and mounting to his seat beside me said quietly one of them fell out on his head they say down the road i had him to deliver at the inn but it can't be blamed on me can it he was not the only philosopher in that company inside rode two passengers one apparently an official sheriff or something the other a doctor who debated all the way the propriety of uniforming the physician in attendance upon executions the sheriff evidently considered such a step an invasion of his official privilege why cried the doctor it is almost impossible now to tell the difference between the doctor and the delinquent ah well sighed the other placidly settling back in his seat just let them once take the wrong man then we shall see through the forest and field over hill and vale by the still waters where far islands lay shimmering upon the summer sea like floating fairylands into the deep gloomy moor went my way the moor was ever most to my liking i was born on the edge of it and once its majesty had sunk into a human soul that soul is forever after attuned to it how little we have the making of ourselves and how much greater the need that we should make of that little the most all of my days i have been preaching against heredity as the arch-enemy of hope and effort and here is mine holding me fast when i see rising out of the dark moor the lonely cairn that sheltered the bones of my fathers before the white christ preached peace to their land a great yearning comes over me there i want to lay mine there i want to sleep under the heather where the bees hum drowsily in the purple broom at noonday and white shadows walk in the night mist from the marshes they are but the people think them wraiths half heathen yet am i yes if to yearn for the soil whence you sprang is to be a heathen heathen am i not half but whole and will be all my days but not so 
he is the heathen who loves not his native land thor long since lost his grip on the sons of the vikings over the battlefield he drives his chariot yet and his hammer strikes fire as of old the british remember it from nelson's raid on copenhagen the germans felt it in eighteen forty nine and again when in the fight for very life the little country held its own a whole winter against two great powers on rapin bent felt it at helgoland where its sailors scattered their navies and drove them from the sea beaten yet never did the white christ work greater transformation in a people once so fierce now so gentle unless when fighting for its firesides forest and field teem with legends that tell of it tell of the battle between the old and the new and the victory of peace every hilltop bears witness to it here by the wayside stands a wooden cross all the countryside knows the story of holy andrew the priest whose piety wrought miracles far and near once upon a time runs the legend he went on a pilgrimage to the holy land and was left behind by his companions because he would not sail be wind and tide ever so fair without first going to mass to pray for a safe journey when his devotions ended he went to the dock he saw only the sail of the departing craft sinking below the horizon overcome by grief and loneliness he stood watching it thinking of friends at home whom he might never again see when a horseman reined in his steed and bade him mount with him he would see him on his way andrew did and fell asleep in the stranger's arms when he awoke he lay on this hill where the cross had stood ever since heard the cattle low and saw the spire of his church in the village where the vesper bells were ringing many months went by before his fellow pilgrims reached home holy andrew lived six hundred years ago a masterful man was he beside a holy one who bluntly told the king the truth when he needed it and knew how to ward the faith and the church committed to his keeping by such were the old rovers weaned from their wild life what a mark he left upon his day is shown yet by the tradition that disaster impends if the cross is allowed to fall into decay once when it was neglected the cattle plague broke out in the parish and ceased says the story not until it was restored when right away there was an end holy andrew's church still stands over yonder not that one with the twin towers that has another story to tell one that was believed to be half for holy legend too until a recent restoration of it brought to light under the whitewash of the reformation mural paintings which furnished the lacking proof that it was all true it was in the days of holy andrew that the pious knight sir asker reeg going to the war told the lady inga to build a new church the folk song tells what was the matter with the old one with wall of clay straw thatched and grim the wall it was mouldy and foul and green and rent with a crack full deep time gnaweth ever with sharper tooth leaves little to mend i ween nothing was left to mend in the church of fiendslieu so she must build anew it is not fitting says the knight in the song to pray to god in such a broken rack the wind blows in and the rain drips christ has gone to his heavenly home no more a manger beseems him and he whispers to her at the leave-taking and thou bearest to our house a boy build a tower upon the church if a daughter come build but a spire a man must fight his way but humility becomes a woman then the fight and the return with victory the impatient ride that left all the rest behind as they neared home the unspoken prayer of the knight as he bent his head over the saddle-bow riding up the hill over the edge of which the church must presently appear that it might be a tower and his sly laugh when it comes into view with two towers for one well might he laugh those twin brothers became the makers of danish history in its heroic age the one a mighty captain the other a great bishop king valdemar's friend and counsellor who fought when there was need as well with sword as with book absalom left the country christian to the core it was his clerk saxo surnamed grammaticus because of his learning 
who gave to the world the collection of chronicles and traditionary lore to which we owe our hamlet the church stands there with its two towers they made haste to restore them when they read in the long hidden paintings the story of sir asker's return and gratitude just as tradition had handed it down from the twelfth century it is not the first time the loyal faith of the people had proved a better guide than carping critics and likely it will not be the last i rediscovered on that trip the ancient bell-woman sole advertising medium before the advent of the printing press the extinct chimney-sweep the ornamental policeman who for professional excitement reads detective novels at home and the sacrificial rites of of what or whom i shall leave unsaid but it must have been an unconscious survival of something of the sort that prompted the butcher to adorn with gay ribbons the poor nag led to the slaughter in the wake of the town drummer he designed it as an advertisement that there would be fresh horse-meat for sale that day the horse took it as a compliment and walked in the procession with visible pride and i found the church in which no collection was ever taken it was the very dome in my own old town the velvet purses that used to be poked into the pews on sundays on long sticks were missing and i asked about them they had not used them for a long time said the beadle and added it was a kind of catholic fashion anyway and no good the pews had apparently suspected as much and had held haughtily aloof from the purses that may have been another reason for their going the old town ever had its own ways they were mostly good ways though sometimes odd who but a reba citizen would have thought of knud clausen's way of doing my wife honour on the sunday morning when as a young girl she went to church to be confirmed her father and knud were neighbours and knud's barnyard was a sore subject between them being right under the other's dining-room window he sometimes protested and oftener offered to buy but knud would neither listen nor sell but he loved the ground his neighbour's pretty daughter walked upon as did indeed every poor man in the town and on her sunday he showed it by strewing the offensive pile with fresh cut grass and leaves and sticking it full of flowers it was well meant and it was danish all over stick up for your rights at any cost these secure go any length to oblige a neighbour journeying so i came from the home of dead kings at last to that of the living old king christian beloved of his people where once my children horrified the keeper of rosenborg palace by playing the wild man of borneo with the official silver lions in the great knight's hall and i saw the old town no more but in my dreams i walk its peaceful streets listen to the whisper of the reeds in the dry moats about the green castle hill and hear my mother call me once more her boy and i know that i shall find them with my lost childhood when we all reach home at last. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 The American Maid Long ago, when I found my work beginning to master me, I put up a nest of fifty pigeon-holes in my office so that with system I might get the upper hand of it, only to find, as the years passed, that I had got fifty tyrants for one. The other day I had to call in a Hessian to help me tame the pigeon-holes. He was a serious library person, and he could not quite make out what it meant when among such heads as slum tenements, the bend, and rum's curse he came upon this one over one of the pigeon-holes him all that goodly company did as deliverer hail they tied a ribbon round his neck another round his tail with all his learning his education was not finished for he had missed the delectable ballad of the waller lot and eugene field's account of the dignities that were heaped upon clough's noble yellow pup else he would have understood the pigeon-hole contained most of the honours that have come to me of late years 
the nominations to membership in societies, guilds and committees, in conventions at home and abroad, most of them declined, as I declined Governor Roosevelt's request that I should serve on the last Tenement House Commission, for the reason which I have given heretofore, that to represent is not my business. To write is. I can do it much better and back up the other. So we are two for one. Not that I would be understood as being insensible of the real honour intended to be conferred by such tokens. I do not hold them lightly. I value the good opinion of my fellow men, for with it comes increased power to do things. But I would reserve the honours for those who have fairly earned them, and on whom they sit easy. They don't on me. I am not ornamental by nature. Now that I have told all there is to tell, the reader is at liberty to agree with my little boy concerning the upshot of it. He was having a heart-to-heart -heart talk with his mother the other day, in the course of which she told him that we must be patient. No one in the world was all good except God. "'And you,' said he, admiringly, "'he is his father's son.' She demurred, but he stoutly maintained his own. "'I bet you,' he said, if you were to ask lots of people round here, they would say you were fine. But, he struggled reflectively with a button, gee, I can't understand why they make such a fuss about Papa. Out of the mouths of babes, etc. The boy is right, I cannot either, and it makes me feel small. I did my work and tried to put into it what I thought citizenship ought to be, when I made it out. I wish I had made it out earlier for my own peace of mind and that is all there is to it. For hating the slum, what credit belongs to me? Who could love it? When it comes to that, perhaps it was the open, the woods, the freedom of my Danish fields I loved, the contrast that was hateful. I hate darkness and dirt anywhere, and naturally want to let in the light. I will have no dark corners in my own cellar. It must be whitewashed clean." Nature, I think, intended me for a cobbler or a patch-tailor. I loved to mend and make crooked things straight. When I was a carpenter, I preferred to make an old house over to building a new. Just now I am trying to help a young couple set up in the laundry business. It is along the same line. That is the reason I picked it out for them. If any of my readers know of a good place for them to start, I wish they would tell me of it. They are just two young people with the world before them. My office, years ago, became notorious as a sort of misfit shop where things were matched that had got mislaid in the hurry and bustle of life, in which some of us always get shoved aside. Someone has got to do that, and I like the job, which is fortunate, for I have no head for creative work of any kind. The publishers bother me to write a novel. Editors want me on their staffs. I shall do neither, for the good reason that I am neither poet, philosopher, nor, I was going to say, philanthropist. But leave me that. I would love my fellow man. For the rest, I am a reporter of facts, and that I would remain. So I know what I can do, and how to do it best. We all love power, to be on the winning side. You cannot help being there when you are fighting the slum for it is the cause of justice and right. How then can you lose? And what matters it how you fare, your cause is bound to win. I said it before, and it will bear to be said again, not once but many times. Every defeat in such a fight is a step toward victory, taken in the right spirit. In the end you will come out ahead. The power of the biggest boss is like chaff in your hands. You can see his finish, and he knows it. Hence, even he will treat you with respect. However he try to bluff you, he is the one who was afraid. The ink was not dry upon Bishop Potter's arraignment of Tammany bestiality before Richard Croker was offering to sacrifice his most faithful henchman as the price of peace. And he would have done it had the bishop but crooked his little finger in the direction of any one of them. The boss has the courage of the brute, or he would not be boss. But when it comes to a moral issue, he is the biggest coward in the lot. The bigger the brute, the more abject its terror at what it does not understand. Some of the honours I refused. There were some my heart craved, and I could not let them go. 
there hangs on my wall the passport governor roosevelt gave me when i went abroad dearer to me than sheepskin or degree for the heart of a friend is in it what would i not give to be worthy of its faithful affection sometimes when i go abroad i wear upon my breast a golden cross which king christian gave me it is the old crusader's cross in the sign of which my stern forefathers conquered the heathen and themselves on many a hard-fought field my father wore it for long and faithful service to the state i rendered none i can think of but one chance i had to strike a blow for the old flag that was when in a typhus epidemic i found the health officers using it as a fever flag to warn boats away from the emergency hospital pier at east sixteenth street they had no idea of what flag it was they just happened to have it on hand but they found out quickly i gave them half an hour in which to find another the hospital was full of very sick patients or i should have made them fire a salute to old dunnebrog by way of reparation as it was i think they had visions of ironclads in the east river they had one of a very angry reporter anyhow but though i did nothing to deserve it i wear the cross proudly for the love i bear the flag under which i was born and the good old king who gave it to me i saw him often when i was a young lad in that which makes the man he had not changed when last i met him in copenhagen they told there how beggars used to waylay him on his daily walks until the police threatened them with arrest then they stood at a distance making sorrowful gestures and the king who understood laid a silver coin upon the palace window shelf and went his way the king must obey the law but he can forget the principles of almsgiving as may the rest of us at christmas and be blameless of that last meeting with king christian i meant to let my american fellow-citizens know so that they may understand what manner of man is he whom they call in europe its first gentleman and in denmark the good king but first i shall have to tell how my father came to wear the cross of dannebrog he was very old at the time retired long since from his post which he had filled faithfully forty years and more in some way i never knew quite how they passed him by with the cross at the time of the retirement perhaps he had given offence by refusing a title he was an independent old man and cared nothing for such things but i knew that the cross he would gladly have worn for the king he had served so well and when he sat in the shadow with the darkness closing in i planned to get it for him as the one thing i knew would give him pleasure but the official red tape was stronger than i until one day roused to anger by it all i wrote direct to the king and told him about it i showed him the wrong that had been done and told him that i was sure he would set it right as soon as he knew of it and i was not mistaken the old town was put into a great state of excitement and mystification when one day there arrived in a large official envelope straight from the king the cross long since given up for indeed the minister had told me that my father having been retired the case was closed the injustice that had been done was itself a bar to its being undone there was no precedent for such action that was what i told the king and also that it was his business to set precedents and he did four years later when i took my children home to let my father bless them they were his only grandchildren and he had never seen any of them he sat in his easy chair and wondered yet at the queer way in which that cross came and i marvelled with him he died without knowing how i had interfered it was better so it was when i went home to mother that i met king christian last they had told me the right way to approach the king the proper number of bows and all that and i meant to faithfully observe it all i saw a tired and lonely old man to whom my heart went out on the instant and i went right up and shook hands and told him how much i thought of him and how sorry i was for his losing his wife the queen louise whom everybody loved he looked surprised a moment then such a friendly look came into his face and i thought him the handsomest king that ever was he asked about the danes in america and i told him they were good citizens 
better for not forgetting their motherland and him in his age and loss he patted my hand with a glad little laugh and bade me tell them how much he appreciated it and how kindly his thoughts were of them all as i made to go after a long talk he stopped me and touching the little silver cross on my coat lapel asked what it was i told him told him of the motto in his name and of the labour of devoted women in our great country to make it mean what it said as i spoke i remembered my father and i took it off and gave it to him bidding him keep it for surely few men could wear it so worthily but he put it back into my hand thanking me with a faithful grasp of his own he could not take it from me he said and so we parted i thought with a pang of remorse as i stood in the doorway of the parting bow i had forgotten and turned around to make good the omission there stood the king in his blue uniform nodding so mildly to me with a smile so full of kindness that i why i just nodded back and waved my hand it was very improper i dare say perfectly shocking but never was heartier greeting to king i meant every bit of it the next year he sent me his cross of gold for the one of silver i offered him i wear it gladly for the knighthood it confers pledges to the defence of womanhood and of little children and if i cannot wield lance and sword as the king's men of old i can wield the pen it may be that in the providence of god the shedding of ink in the cause of right shall set the world farther ahead in our day than the bloodletting of all the ages past these i could not forgo neither when friends gathered in the king's daughter's settlement on our silver wedding day and with loving words gave to the new house my name could i say them nay it stands that house within a stone's throw of many a door in which i sat friendless and forlorn trying to hide from the policeman who would not let me sleep within hail of the bend of the wicked past atoned for at last of the bowery boarding-house where i lay senseless on the stairs after my first day's work in the newspaper office starved well nigh to death but the memory of the old days has no sting its message is one of hope the house itself is the keynote it is the pledge of a better day of the defeat of the slum with its helpless heredity of despair that shall damn no longer lives yet unborn children of god are we that is our challenge to the slum and on earth we shall claim yet our heritage of light of home and neighbourliness restored it is the pledge the want of them makes the great gap in the city life that is to be our modern civic life with the home preserved we may look forward without fear there is no question that can be asked of the republic to which we shall not find the answer we may not always agree as to what is right but starting there we shall be seeking the right and seeking we shall find it ruin and disaster are at the end of the road that starts from the slum perhaps it is easy for me to preach contentment with a mother who prays a wife who fills the house with song and the laughter of happy children about me all my dreams come true or coming true why should i not be content in fact i know of no better equipment for making them come true faith in god to make all things possible that are right faith in man to get them done fun enough in between to keep them from spoiling or running off the track into useless crankery an extra good sprinkling of that the longer i live the more i think of humour as in truth the saving sense a civil service examination to hit home might well be one to make sure the man could appreciate a good story for all editors i would have that kind made compulsory here is one chiding me in his paper oh a serious paper that calls upon parents to insist that children's play shall be play and not loafing and not be allowed to obscure their more serious responsibilities chiding me for encouraging truancy we are quite sure he writes that no really well brought up and well disposed boy ever thinks of such a thing perish the thought and yet if he should take the notion you never can tell with the devil so busy all the time there's the barrel they kept us in at school when we were bad 
I told of it before. Putting the lid on was a sure preventive. With our little short legs we couldn't climb out. Don't think I recommend it. It just comes to me, the way things will. It was held to be a powerful means of bringing children up well disposed in those days. Looking back over thirty years, it seems to me that never had man better a time than I. Enough of the editor chaps there were always to keep up the spirits. The hardships people write to me about were not worth while mentioning. And anyway they had to be, to get some of the crankery out of me, I guess. But the friendships endure. For all the rebuffs of my life they have more than made up. When I think of them, of the good men and women who have called me friend, I am filled with wonder and gratitude. I know the editor of the heavy responsibilities would not have approved of all of them. Even the police might not have done it. But then, police approval is not a certificate of character to one who has lived the best part of his life in Mulberry Street. They drove Harry Hill out of the business after milking him dry. Harry Hill kept a dive, but he was a square man. His word was as good as his bond. He was hardly a model citizen, but in a hard winter he kept half the ward from starving. His latch-string hung out always to those in need. Harry was no particular friend of mine. I mention him as a type of some to whom objection might be made. But then the police would certainly disapprove of Dr. Parkhurst, whom I am glad to call by the name of friend. They might even object to Bishop Potter, whose friendship I return with a warmth that is nowise dampened by his disapproval of reporters as a class. There is where the bishop is mistaken. We are none of us infallible, and what a good thing it is that we are not. Think of having an infallible friend to live alongside of always. How long could you stand it? We were not infallible. James Tanner, called Corporal by the world, Jim by us, when we sat together in the front seats of the old Eighteenth Street Church under Brother Simmons's teaching. Far from it, but we were willing to learn the ways of grace, and that was something. Had he only stayed. Your wife mothered my Elizabeth when she was homesick in a strange land. I have not forgotten it. And you could pass civil service, Jim, on the story I spoke of. I would be willing to let the rest go, if you will promise to forget about that bottle of champagne. It was your doings, anyhow, you know. Amos Ensign, I did not give you the credit you should have had for our success in Mulberry Street in the early days, but I give it to you now. You were loyal and good, and you have stayed a reporter, a living denial of the charge that our profession is not as good as the best. Dr. Jane Elizabeth Robbins, you told me, when I was hesitating over the first chapters of these reminiscences, to take the short cut and put it all in, and I did, because you are as wise as you are good. I have told it all, and now, manlike, I will serve you as your sex has been served from the dawn of time. The woman did it. Yours be the blame. Anthony Ron, dear old chum in the days of adversity. Max Fischel, trusty friend of the years in Mulberry Street, who never said can't once. You always knew a way. Brother W. W. J. Warren, faithful in good and in evil report. General C. T. Christensen, whose compassion passeth understanding, for, though a banker, you bore with and befriended me, who cannot count. Mrs. Josephine Shaw Lowell, my civic conscience ever. John H. Mulcahy, without whose wise counsels in the days of good government and reform the battle with the slum would surely have gone against us. Jane Adams and Mrs. Emmons Blaine, leaven that shall yet leaven the whole unsightly lump out yonder by the western lake and let in the light. A. S. Solomons, Silas McBee, Mrs. Rowland C. Lincoln, Lillian D. Wald, Felix Adler, Endicott Peabody, Lyman Abbott, Louise Seymour Houghton, Jacob H. Schiff, John Finley, Jew and Gentile, who taught me why in this world personal conduct and personal character count ever for most. My love to you all. It is time I am off and away. William McCloy, the next time I step into your canoe and upset it, and you turn that smiling countenance upon me, up to your neck in the lake, 
I will surely drown you. You are too good for this world. J. Evarts Tracy, host of my happy days on restful Wawaskesh. I know of a certain hole in under a shelving rock upon which the partridge is wont to hatch her young, where lies a bigger bass than ever you tired out according to the rules of your beloved sport, and I will have him if I have to charm him with honeyed words and a bean-pole, and Ainsley shall cook him to a turn. Make haste, then, to the feast. Ahead there is light. Even as I write, the little ones from Cherry Street are playing on the grass under my trees. The time is at hand when we shall bring to them in their slum the things which we must now bring them to see, and then the slum will be no more. How little we grasp the meaning of it all! In a report of the Commissioner of Education, I read the other day that of kindergarten children in an eastern city who were questioned, sixty-three per cent did not know a robin, and more than half had not seen a dandelion in its yellow glory. And yet we complain that our cities are misgoverned. You who think that the teaching of civics in the school covers it all, I am not speaking to you. You will never understand. But the rest of you who are willing to sit with me at the feet of little Molly and learn from her, listen. She was poor and ragged and starved. Her home was a hovel. We were debating, some good women who knew her, and I, how best to make a merry Christmas for her, and my material mind hung upon clothes and boots and rubbers, for it was in Chicago. But the vision of her soul was a pair of red shoes. Her heart craved them. I, brethren, and she got them. Not for all the gold in the treasury would I have trodden it under in pork and beans, smothered it in. No, not in rubber boots, though the mud in the city by the lake be both deep and black. They were the window, those red shoes, through which her little captive soul looked out and yearned for the beauty of God's great world. Could I forget the blue boots with the tassels which I worshipped in my boyhood? Nay, friends, the robin and the dandelion we must put back into those barren lives if we would have good citizenship. They and the citizenship are first cousins. We robbed the children of them, or stood by and saw it done, and it is for us to restore them. That is my answer to the missionary who writes to ask what is the most practical way of making good Christians and American citizens out of the emigrants who sit heavy on her conscience, as well they may. Christianity without the robin and the dandelion is never going to reach down into the slum. American citizenship without them would leave the slum there to dig the grave of it and of the republic. Light ahead! The very battle that is now waged for righteousness on the once forgotten east side is our answer to the cry of the young who, having seen the light, were willing no longer to live in darkness. I know, for I was one of the committee which Dr. Felix Adler called together in response to their appeal a year ago. The committee of fifteen succeeded to its work. What does it all help, the doubting Thomases have asked a half-score years, watching the settlements build their bridge of hearts between mansion and tenement, and hundreds give devoted lives of toil and sacrifice to make it strong and lasting? And ever the answer came back sturdily wait and see it will come and now it has come the work is bearing fruit on the east side the young rise in rebellion against the slum on the west side the league for political education runs a ball ground omen of good sense and of victory so the country is safe when we fight no longer for the poor but with the poor the slum is taken in the rear and beaten already the world moves the bend is gone, the barracks are gone, Mulberry Street itself as I knew it so long is gone. Cat Alley, whence came the deputation of ragamuffins to my office, demanding flowers for the lady in the back, the poor old scrubwoman who lay dead in her dark basement, went when the Elm Street widening led light into the heart of our block. The old days are gone, I myself am gone. A year ago I had warning that the night cometh when no man can work, and Mulberry Street knew me no more. I am still a young man, not far past fifty, and I have much I would do yet. 
but what if it were ordered otherwise? I have been very happy. No man ever had so good a time. Should I not be content? I dreamed a beautiful dream in my youth, and I awoke and found it true. My silver bride they called her just now. The frost is upon my head, indeed. Hers winter has not touched with its softest breath. Her footfall is the lightest, her laugh the merriest in the house. The boys are all in love with their mother, the girls tyrannize and worship her together. The cadet corps elects her an honorary member, for no stouter champion of the flag is in the land. Sometimes, when she sings with the children, I sit and listen, and with her voice there comes to me as an echo of the long past, the words in her letter, that blessed first letter in which she wrote down the text of my afterlife. We will strive together for all that is noble and good. So she saw her duty as a true American, and I, she has kept the pledge. But here comes our daughter with little Virginia to visit her grandpapa. Oh, the little vixen! Then where is his peace? God bless the child. I have told the story of the making of an American. There remains to tell how I found out that he was made and finished at last. It was when I went back to see my mother once more, and, wandering about the country of my childhood's memories, had come to the city of Elsinore. There I fell ill of a fever, and lay many weeks in the house of a friend, upon the shore of the beautiful Orisund. One day, when the fever had left me, they rolled my bed into a room overlooking the sea. The sunlight danced upon the waves, and the distant mountains of Sweden were blue against the horizon. Ships passed under full sail up and down the great waterway of the nations. But the sunshine and the peaceful day bore no message to me. I lay moodily picking at the coverlet, sick and discouraged and sore. I hardly knew why myself. Until, all at once, there sailed past, close inshore, a ship flying at the top, the flag of freedom, blown out on the breeze till every star in it shone bright and clear. That moment I knew. Gone were illness, discouragement, and gloom. Forgotten weakness and suffering, the cautions of doctor and nurse. I sat up in bed and shouted, laughed, and cried by turns, waving my handkerchief to the flag out there. They thought I had lost my head, but I told them no, thank God, I had found it, and my heart, too, at last. I knew then that it was my flag, that my children's home was mine, indeed, that I also had become an American in truth, and I thanked God, and, like unto the man sick of the palsy, arose from my bed, and went home, healed. End of chapter 16 End of The Making of an American by Jacob A. Rees Recording by Lee Smalley